Present. So if we could have someone nominate someone from the floor. Okay, that was a nomination for Ken Womet. Anyone second? Yeah. Chief? <laughs> Sure. I'm sorry about that. Um, can we have the eyes for Ken? Everyone in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I was advised that if you're going to be speaking, you can remove your mask while you're speaking. So if you, you know, raise your hand and we recognize you, they'll bring a mic to you. You can uh, take your mask off and speak so you're heard more clearly. Thank you. Okay, I was given this, but before we start with the actual formal town meeting, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, Mary McClintock. I have not touched it. Okay, great. Can you hear me with my mask on? Yeah. Alrighty then. Alrighty then. Well, I my bet is that everyone here knows Joe Strugowski. Raise your hand if you know Joe Strugowski. Alrighty. And if you're like me, and you've only lived in Conway since 1984, it's hard to imagine living in Conway without Joe's leadership. Joe's term on the planning board is ending, and we want to take a moment to say thank you, Joe, for your decades of service to Conway. Joe. come up here. So, so just in case you forgot, Joe's been in a major leadership role in Conway since 1984. He was on the select board from 1984 to 2008. And in the early days, the select board also served as the planning board and the conservation commission. He was the emergency management director from 2006 to 2010 and he's been on the planning board from 2012 until now when his term is ending. Now, truth in advertising, he's not leaving all leadership positions. He's still on the wastewater committee that he has chaired since 2014. That's the sewer rats. Um, so I've learned a lot from Joe while serving with him on the planning board, and what I appreciate about Joe's leadership is his willingness to listen to everyone, his openness to considering different perspectives, his hard and smart work to address the concerns of people in town. I have not always been on the same side of the table as Joe. And even when I sat on the opposite side of the table, I clearly saw how Joe always holds the best interest of the town in his heart and mind. So let's say thank you again to Joe. <laughs> Woo! Natalie. Joe? And I'd like to welcome Conway State Representative Natalie Blay to join us in celebrating Joe. It's a little hot under this mask. Yeah. So Joe, I'm here today representing the Commonwealth of Massachusetts House of Representatives to issue a citation to you. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Joe Strogowski in recognition of your decades of service to the town of Conway. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. This is given this 20th day of June 2020 
At the State House, Boston, Massachusetts, it is signed by Speaker of the House Robert DeLeo and by myself, State Representative Natalie Blay. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, I don't have a speech prepared. Mary told me some friend of hers asked about my years of experience, and I knew that was I knew that was a scam. So I gave her bad information. Congratulations, Joe. Uh, one, one more announcement. Um, I was asked, Jim Recor has something he would like to speak on the pool before we get into the formal town meeting, just for public information. Hi, everybody. I'm, I hope you all realize that the pool is open even in these extreme circumstances. It took us a, uh, quite a bit of work to do it, to make it work, and the rules that are there um, were set by the governor, by his council, and what I'd really like to ask, especially about face masks, we'd like you to wear them there when you're not in the water, even if you're more than six feet apart, because it's unclear his beach uh, rules don't follow the same as phase two, or step two of phase two. So we'd just like to remind you that we're open and we'll stay open as long as people are there and following the rules correctly. I just wanted to drive that point home to you today. Well, let's get on with town meeting. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic over to Chairman Joe Stragowski for the Board of Selectmen. Oh, pardon me. No longer. I'm looking at Joe. John O'Rourke. First of all, thank you for being here. Four months ago, none of us could have envisioned that we would be here today on the first day of summer, on the first day of the Triple Crown, the Belmont Stakes, and here in this absolutely great facility, which the facilities, the Highway Facilities Committee did an absolutely great job. I'd like to recognize them now. Walter Goodridge, who's the chair, unfortunately is not here today because he's in quarantine. But let me recognize the other members. We have Ken Wimet. We have Ron Sweet. Ron, where are you? Ron Sweet. We've got Liv Wyatt. Where's Liv? Is Liv here? Peter Jeswald. Peter? And Hank Horseman. Hank, where are you? Hank, thank you. They did an absolutely tremendous job on this project, and as you can see, the maintenance building has been started right next door. Peter, do you have any comments? Um, I just wanted to say that I have, uh, although we all worked really hard on this building, and the two buildings, uh, Walter Goodrich, I'm really sad he can't be here today, worked extremely, extremely hard. I've known Walter since 1971 when I had hair and it was down to my shoulders. I, I helped him build his house and his garage. I helped him on two other houses. I think I was the first person to unload boilers and stoves from Denmark in his, his uh, tecton days. But I've never worked on a project on which he has worked harder 
and dedicated more time and had more sleepless nights and, and just thought out of the box constantly on how to get these two buildings done and through a very difficult process um, at, at the most cost-effective yet pleasing construction possible. So if we yell loud enough, Walter, you might be able to hear us on the hill over there. So please give a cheer for Walter, even though he's not here. That's great. Thank you, Peter. All of you received the town report in the mail, and hopefully you've at least taken a cursory look at it. Uh, certainly it gives you an idea of how much work goes into running a small town like this. We have tremendous volunteers on our boards, our committees, our commissions uh, that do an awful lot of work to make sure the town runs properly. Uh, and again, you can, you can see the kind of work in this, in this um, report. Lisa, where are you? Lisa Tarowski? Where are you, Lisa? Stand up, Lisa. Oh, there you are. Okay. Lisa and Tom worked on this. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, Lisa Road heard on everybody who wasn't getting their report in on time. I want to thank the Finance Committee that the uh, Select Board worked with very closely to come up with our budget. You know, certainly we start the budget process in November, and by the end of February, we had a really good budget. We, we were in really good shape, and then uh, the coronavirus came along. So we had to basically start from scratch again, uh, and with no information from the state, we've tried to put a budget together uh, that makes sense, that's flexible, and that provides all the essential services to our residents. We have Alan Singer, who's the chair of the Finance Committee, Rihanna McLeister. Uh, where's Roy? I saw Roy here. Where are you, Roy? Roy Cohen. Where's Tom Donovan? Is Tom here? All right. So we have four members here, and we have a vacancy. So anyone who wants to fill that vacancy, please let Alan know. We had the Capital Improvements Planning Committee work very hard for us on our capital items. Trish Vincasey is the chair of that committee. Trish, are you here? Stand up, Trish. Trish worked very hard with the committee to put together some really good uh, capital improvements for us that make a lot of sense. On her committee, Roy Cohen is the finance rep. Bob Armstrong is our select board rep. Where's Russ French? Is he here? Russ? Russ is not here. Uh, and Brian Kosmeskis. Where's Brian? Brian, are you here? No. Where? Way in the back. Thank you very much, Brian, for your help. All during the year, our finance team, on a weekly or biweekly basis, meets to make sure our finances are in great shape. That team is Tom Hutchison, our town administrator, Jan Warner, our treasurer, Lynn Kane, our assistant treasurer, Lee Whitcomb, our administrative treasurer, Mike Cosiella, our accountant, and Alan Singer, our finance chair. They do a great job of keeping us on track with our finances. I have a couple of uh, comments on the warrant. You know that our original town meeting was set for May 11th. Unfortunately, because we weren't getting a lot of good information or actually no information from the state, uh, we had to you know, do some planning that was outside of the normal circumstances. Normally, we get information from the state and we go by that to put together our, um, our budget. That meeting was postponed till May, June 8th and then here on the 20th. And again, 
uh, it was because we were getting no information from the state that we had to keep postponing the town meeting. There are a couple of items I just want to point out on our Article 2, our operating budget. Line uh, 193, town insurance, that went up because of an increase in workers' compensation and some uh, uh, damage from the tornado. That, was, that line item was due to uh, increase in workers' comp and some damage from the tor tornado that still is in the, in the premium. On the Board of Health, we had a $25,000 increase, primarily because of the increase in recycling costs. That has gone up tremendously in the last couple of years. Uh, item 751 is debt service. All right, that's the debt service for this building and the maintenance building. And employee costs, item 900 for 62723 we had six new and more expensive plans that employees have filed into, uh, and we had costs from the retirement system. So those were, those were costs that we really didn't have a lot of control over that amounted to about $169,000. Uh, you'll note that the bottom line on the warrant went up $127,890. So you can see a lot of negatives on the change from uh, fiscal 2020 to fiscal 2021. We asked our departments to do some voluntary cuts, and they really came through for us. So we think this, this budget is in good shape. We want to thank our schools. Where's Darius? Darius, where are you? Darius, stand up. Darius worked with us. And you can see how the Frontier budget actually went down. That is, that is absolutely fantastic. He did a great job on that. Uh, Kristen Gordon kept her budget uh, level funded at the grammar school. That was outstanding. Uh, Superintendent Martin. Is Kristen here? Where's Kristen? Where's Kristen? Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Richard Martin, who's the superintendent of the Franklin Tech Schools, also had a declining budget. And I want to introduce John Carey. Where is John? He's the assistant principal up at the tech school. The schools did an outstanding job for us on the budget in these very trying times. I also want to point out three articles on the warrant, six, seven, and eight. Originally, we approved, we approved these articles at the June 8th meeting. And one of the things we were trying to do with these articles was basically um, to put into play monies that we had basically in capital stabilization, free cash, or, or better known as undesignated funds, uh, and, and borrowing. Okay, we wanted to make sure that you knew our thinking in terms of what deficits we may face from state aid that we're not going to receive. So we put these three on the warrant on June 8th. I had a meeting on June 9th uh, at the Massachusetts Municipal Association Board of Directors. Um, about half of the, of the municipalities at that meeting were going to do similar things to make sure they could cover any deficits uh, from state aid. On the 17th, which was this past Wednesday, we received a memo from our town accountant. Um, he was not happy with these articles. 
um, it seems that Article 6, if you move funds from capital stabilization into the general fund because of the way municipal accounting works, that counts as revenue. Even though it's our money, it's in capital stabilization, you move it to another account for purposes of figuring the tax rate, it counts as revenue. So essentially what that would have done was lower the tax rate. However, it would have spiked the tax rate in 2022. So we decided in a meeting uh, on yesterday actually of the board, we decided we would pass over that article. There was also, uh, Mike did not like Article 7 about free cash. Uh, I don't quite disagree, I don't quite agree with him on the way he analyzed that. Um, the Department of Revenue is letting uh, municipalities use free cash to cover uh, expenditures in the 2021 uh, fiscal year budget. So we're okay on that, but we can do that. We don't need a town uh, meeting vote on that. We can do that with a meeting of the Board of Selectmen. So we're okay on that. So we're going to pass that over. Uh, authorization to borrow 200 to cover deficits, 200,000 to cover deficits. Um, again, that was something that we put in there just for authorization. Uh, again, we had, when we looked at this, on, we still had no information from the state on Wednesday. So we got this meeting together for yesterday and decided to pass that over as well. On Thursday, I got some very reliable information about what the state is going to do. Uh, it, it appears that the state is going to go with a 112th budget for July. They are probably going to go with a 112th budget for August, and hopefully in September, they have their budget. So, what we're going to have to do, after we find out what the state does with their budget in September, and what we collect in property taxes on November 1st, we're going to need to do a special town meeting in November to figure out exactly where we are uh, in terms of, of finances for the remaining part of fiscal 2021. So I just, wanted to give you, I just wanted to give you an explanation of those things so that you know our thinking. Uh, and again, the Finance Committee did a great job with us in helping us plan this. Um, and we thank them for it. Thank you, Alan, and your committee. Thank you all. Okay, are we ready to get going on this so we can get out of here? Oh, yes. Uh, if anybody gets thirsty or dehydrated, we have coolers of water right there. Free for the taking, I guess. There you go. No mixers with it. We're going to charge for the mixers. Okay. Okay. Um, so if there are no objections, I will dispense with reading the warrant. There are extra copies of the warrant at the registrar's table. Do we hear any motion on that? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. So let's go to Article 2. John? Can't hear it. There's a motion to separate those into their contingent parts and go through our budget. Yeah, we, we'll take our, we'll take a. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You want to read Article Two, John? Yeah. I move to accept the FY21 operating budget as presented in Article 2A.
Go ahead. I would make a motion that we do these line by line. That, that well, motion's already been made. Do we have a second on that motion? Second. Any other discussion? We're ready to vote on the motion to take them line by line. All those in favor of taking them line by line, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Say the nays have it. Okay. Item A. Certainly, if you have a question on any one of those, take a moment. Raise your hand if you got a question, and we'll see if we can get an answer for them. State your name, please. I'd like to speak on Article 150, Town Administrator and the Town Administration's salary and wages. I don't think it's fair that he gets a raise and everybody else gets nothing. Thank you. Yeah, on, on that particular line item, that isn't, that isn't Tom's salary. That's Tom's salary, his assistant, and a, another administrative uh, assistant for the committees. That's not all, Tom. Uh, we did negotiate and approve a new contract for Tom that starts on July 1. Michelle Harris, Sheldon Falls Road. Um, to go along with Malcolm's question, Tom's salary specifically is going up 6% this year when the average, hold on, I had to take notes, when the average SSA cost of living benefit for the last five years has been an average of 1.34%, he's requesting a 6% increase while the rest of the town is on a pay freeze. And I guess the bottom line question is, why? That was a negotiated contract. Uh, it was a very fair contract in terms of what surrounding towns are paying their town administrators. Um, again, we're, we're totally in line with the market with Tom's contract. It's a three-year contract that starts on July 1. Uh, it's different than other salary increases. So, um, so I, I just wanted to be clear. So, so the, the vote to approve Tom's new contract was a two-to-one vote. I dissented. And, and I dissented. The, 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 the process for negotiating this contract, I just want people to know that, you know, I, I was never given the chance to speak with Tom Hutchinson about the, his contract, nor was, nor was Bob. That, that uh, in, in, you know, we did executive session negotiations with our town, with, with the select board chair, representing Tom Hutchinson and the town. And that's how we negotiated. Um, and and uh, you know, I, was, I was informed early on that, that, that his raise was just non-negotiable. And the, the, the thing about it was that you, know, there's, there, the, you hear the argument that there's this salary survey, a FERCOG salary survey. And what I had asked was that we actually go through that and compare towns that are similarly situated as ours, towns with under 2,000 population, towns without sewage treatment plants, towns without, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't do that. We just sort of looked at it all. And yeah, there's towns that pay their town administrator $90,000. So that, you know, the, the, the idea that we're using a survey as some sort of actual data point I thought was just false. It's, it, we're not using it in that method. We're just using it as a fig leaf to give the man a, 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 a substantial raise, which is, which is all well and good if you think that that's what we should be doing. But you know, my other point in all of this was that uh, you know, he's been our town administrator for six years now, and when we, hired, when, we, when we changed our form of government to go away from the town administrative assistant position, I don't know if you remember Tom Spiro, um, the, uh, and, and we changed our form of government to go to the town administrative, uh, administrator form of government, um, and, and we knew that we were doubling the line item salary for that, 
uh, position back then. Since then, the difference has even grown larger. But I, I remember um, John O'Rourke standing up and saying, you know, we should do this because we're, th there's not going to be a difference to the town uh, financially, that, that he'll make up the difference with grant writing. And, um, and my, my whole point in all that was that, you know, we've had enough of a track yet record that we can see whether or not the premise underlying our switch to the town administrator form of government still holds true. Um, and, and I had asked that, that that be brought before town meeting so that the town meeting can decide whether we still want to go forward with the town administrator with whether we want to go back to a town administrative assistant, or there's a middle level of service that you can provide, which is a town coordinator. And each one of those have different price range and different abilities and different, uh, you, uh, you know, the, the, for the town. But, but I thought that this, was, this would have been a good chance and a good opportunity to, 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 to have it come before town meeting and so that we can once again decide um, if, if this is what we want to do. And, and if the arguments behind, uh, you know, uh, giving, g renewing him for three years and giving him the, the, the substantial pay raise were so strong that w you shouldn't hesitate to make those arguments in front of town meeting and convince your fellow residents. But we didn't do that. So I thought the process was wrong, the result was wrong, and here we are. So okay. sorry. John? The process we used to negotiate Tom's contract was the correct process. It was the right process. Uh, we looked at other towns, what they were paying. Uh, we, we negotiated a very fair contract with Tom. Our negotiations were delayed for at least a month because Philip had all kinds of questions. And at each meeting, we satisfied those questions. At the end of the process, Philip agreed that he had no more questions. However, <laughs> Philip knew that I would vote for the contract and Bob would vote for the contract, so he decided not to vote for the contract just so he could say he didn't vote for the contract. And that's the way, and that's the way that goes. Sir? Yeah. Hang on, we got a mic coming over to you. Hang on, Gary, you're coming with a mic. Gary Fenton, nine, Roaring Brook Road, Conway. Just have one comment, and I'm, I heard the vote was two to one. It, this isn't a town meeting issue, is it? It's a contract. So we're, it's, we're, you guys we're, signed we're, the contract. We're, the Board of Selectmen voted two to one. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but the contract is done, and the vote was taken. Yeah, we're, oh, we're discussing the article, the uh, individual line items. We're going to vote on the overall budget of an A of Article 2. Motion to move to a vote. Okay. All right. It's been, motion has been moved and seconded. We're ready to vote. The question has been called. Are we ready to vote on the uh, calling the question? All those in favor of calling the question signify by saying aye. aye. Those who would like to continue the discussion signify by saying nay. nay. I believe the nays have it. Okay, somebody had their hand up. Can't hear you. I could do that without. Is this working? There you go. Oh, my. I'm getting close to that. I will yell. If you can hear me, tell me. I'm not sucking on those microphones. <laughs> um, in this pandemic time, I think that what we all need to realize is that what we need is equality. Town employee deserves a raise while the rest are not getting it. I don't think the highway guys who are there every time that you need them, the fire department, the teachers, everybody that works for the town in this capacity should be treated as an equal. 
So I think it's not okay that we're giving someone a huge raise that's against Okay, let's, it's a little hot in here, so let's try to get through this. Go ahead, in the back. Parsons Hill Road, while I agree with all the um, conversation that's been going on, please note that the teachers did get their raise for next year. Okay, so that was a little bit on the erroneous side. And as tough as it is, and I know it's tough, Seriously, a contract is a contract. That's the bottom line. It's a contract. Let's not play that game of now we're going to open everybody's contract and go back to the, the table. It's done. It's a contract. Let's move on. It is, do we have anybody else who has anything that they have to add? Bob? Is it working? Good. Uh, it, Tom, Tom is not just like a town employee. Tom, Tom has a contract, just like the teachers have a contract. We negotiated Tom's contract based on the fact that his pay was way, way below the average of the similar towns our size, and we felt that it was appropriate to raise his salary to, for the first year of the contract to, the, to be at least close to the... Uh, to the average salary of towns our size. Now everybody's talking about Tom Spiro and what happened before this, and I don't want to go into details, but I knew very few people who were sad to see Tom Spiro leave. So, uh, I, you know, I for one am really thankful we have Tom as our town administrator. He's a really highly qualified town administrator. There are people in town who don't like him, uh, you know, whatever. But Tom does an excellent job, and we're lucky to have him. Address the fact that at this town meeting... Could, could, you, could you state your name? Could Sorry. you state your name, please? Karen Eldred, Elm Street. At a previous town meeting, a number of people at its last negotiated contract expressed their dissatisfaction. And here we are again with a contract taken care of in spite of what people said last time. I feel like listening to the town. I just have, I'm Ron Hawks from Academy Hill. Uh, I'd just like to say, when I, I used to work for the state and work for a union, and they negotiated a contract which was voted in. And if the state didn't have the money, we didn't get the raise. So we had to put up with not getting a raise even though there was a contract. I can't hear you. Make him do a contract. That's it's cutting it. It's that that mic is cutting in and out. Is that better? Oh. That's better. So I don't know if it's a motion to be made, but I feel like we have two options. We either break the contract and fire Tom, and pay, what is it, maybe four months of unemployment, and hire somebody for cheaper, maybe just as qualified, maybe not, or let's just make a motion not to do and not to honor the contract and break the contract. Uh, those are the two sort of options we have. I don't believe you can make a motion to break the contract here at town meeting. You're here, we got a motion to accept or not accept this article. So we're going to vote on the article. Okay, anybody have anything new that we haven't heard? Yes. Can't hear you.
Apparently only one mic is working. I've, I've worked on committees for the town for a long time, and I can tell you the stability and professionalism since Tom Hutchinson came in is a breath of fresh air. And to suggest that suddenly here this big group reanalyze our form of government and reanalyze uh, a, a merit and a professional employee-based system on a contract now is, is, uh, is, is demeaning and, in my view, very unnecessary. Uh, I think this is something that the personnel committee and the select board need to take under advisement, maybe have some hearings, get other citizen input, but this is not the way to do it. And I do want to say I've seen uh, additional grants come in and uh, enabling the work of, of uh, volunteers has been much, much improved. Okay. Go ahead, John. I talk to town administrators all over the Commonwealth, and unsolicited, I get comments about how lucky we are to have Tom as our town administrator. We have negotiated a very fair contract with Tom. We looked at all the information we had to in terms of surrounding towns. And I, I don't know what the problem is here, OK? We negotiated the contract. The contract's in place. The contract was put in place before the pandemic started. We need to honor the contract. OK. All right, Malcolm. say in his contract, correct? And if they did, did you do a survey of the highway department and other surrounding towns, what their wages are? I'd like to know that. Thank you. Okay, anybody want to address the question? No, we, we didn't because there weren't any contracts for the highway department. Lee? It's working. Hello. It's test, test, test. Hello. Okay. Oh, thank you. Lee Whitcomb, Ashfield Road. The FERCOG salary summary. Okay. The the Test, test, test. Okay. It, we just... The salary summary prepared by the FERCOG is available for anyone to see online. You just write in FERCOG salary summary on your search line. It will come up. It lists every job in every town, the pay, the pay for assistance, what benefits are covered. Anyone can look it up anytime. So I've found it to be very interesting and kind of passed it around in the last few weeks when people were asking questions. And if you're interested, I hope that you will take the time to look it up. OK, are we ready to vote on this? Section A. All those in favor of Section A. Stand here. I have a question. Kay Clayton Jones, Husak Road. I have a question unrelated to Tom's salary. Would that, may I speak to that? I am curious about the FERCOG town nurse under the Board of Health's salary. I am wondering what the town nurse that is, um, does for the town right now. 
I know that I provide through my foot care services a service that is used by a lot of the elders in town, and I'm wondering where, no, I'm wondering how that combines in, but also more importantly, what is the value of the town nurse to the town, at, especially at a time of pandemic? And maybe it's just that it's brought into the t Board of Health budget, but that just seems a rising number, and I would like to see the cost-benefit okay. analysis of that. Who's it going to address that, Board of Health or our town administrator? Board of Health? Anybody? Does anybody here have any information on our town nurse, other than we know she's Lisa White? We have to recognize our town administrator because he's not a town resident. Everybody okay with Tom speaking? Lisa White holds uh, office hours in Conway on the first Mondays, or at least before the pandemic hit. Uh, she came once a month to do general checkups for anybody who wanted to come, as well as serving as our liaison regarding things like um, regional tick efforts, uh, and, and she's been very active in this uh, in the pandemic as well, and uh, is in constant communication or in frequent communication with the Board of Health uh, about that. Um, she's available to answer questions, and uh, that's that's what I can tell you. And and it would be the Board of Health who knew um, more specifically uh, what her job what their relationships with her have been. The only other thing I can add to that is that quite often I will meet with Lisa when she's in town and she will ask me if there's any seniors or anybody specifically that I know of that maybe could use it just to check in, just to say hi and make sure their well-being is okay. Uh, other than that, I can't speak on it. Lee, you have something to add? Does that answer your question? John? John, that line item covers all of FERCOG services, not just Lisa White. Just to clarify what John said, she is not covering that budget. That line item, she's in with the Board of Health. I mean, yes. Right. Okay, so that. I... that that that's what Joe just made the comment that that is actually a FERCOG's cost to the town, not the town nurse. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, are we ready to vote on this? All those in favor of Section A of Article 2 signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Okay, Article, uh, Section A passes. Section B, the grammar school operating and grammar school transportation. I move to accept the fiscal year 2021 operating budget as presented in Article 2B. Okay, do we have any discussion on those? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, that carries. Section C, Frontier Regional Operating and Frontier Transportation. I move to accept fiscal year 2021 operating budget as presented in Article 2C. Went down. All those in favor? 
Opposed? Perfect. D, the technical schools. I move to accept the fiscal year 2021 operating budget as presented in Article 2D. Go ahead. Hang on, hang on. The question is, it says schools plural. It's Hang on. Plural. It said plural schools. So are we talking about any schools other than Franklin County Tech? Mr. So this Monterey. does not include Smith Vocational? Yes. This line item includes Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School. Do we have a breakout? It's in... It's in my budget document. It's can not I in. Can I ask that next not, year that be presented? In, in the future? For, it can be under technical schools, but just which e each vocational school gets. Just I, a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion on this article? All those in favor? Opposed? I'm just waiting for the crash. All right, he's gone. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? No move. Okay. Article three. I move that the town transfer $25,800 from free cash to the general fund for capital expenses for the Conway Grammar School. Okay, this does take a two-thirds vote. Before we even go into this, do I have four people to be counters if we need them? Four volunteers. One, two, three, one more? Four, okay, thank you. Okay. Explanation. Somebody want to speak on this article? Thomas. Sorry. This is not a two thirds vote? No, this it's a transfer from free cash. Okay. Sorry, that was. Um, this is not a two thirds vote. Uh, that was uh, when it was uh, possibly going to be a transfer from. The capital, the Conway Grammar School capitalization, uh, capital stabilization fund. Okay. Do we so? Do we need a explanation on this article? Tom, could we have an explanation of the article itself? Security enhancements to the school, uh, a new uh, door lock system. As far as I know, I think Kent. I, I think uh, Chief Wimet is also aware of that. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Do we, can we recognize the superintendent of the schools? Yes. Okay. Darius? It's, a, <clears throat> it's for the replacement of the flooring in one classroom, the, uh, the carpeting in the hallway, and a new water fountain in the upper end. Oh, multiple items. Yeah. Is that correct, Chris? Did I miss anything? Right. So okay, any other questions on this article? All those in favor? Opposed? Did I hear an A? No? Okay. Article 4. I move that the town transfer $8,066 from free cash to the general fund for capital expenses for the Frontier Regional School District, including purchasing and installing electric corridor holds, repairing the central clock system, and repairing the exterior and interior intercom system as part of a total $48,500 expense. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We're in a COVID pandemic. What in heaven's name is going on with the schools? It seems it's going back to normal. If we don't have any students going back to school, why are we spending money on things for empty buildings? Okay, I, I'll 
speak, I'll let Darius speak on that. I just want to make a, one comment on that. Is I've been to the high school several times for drills, and I know there's sections of that school when they make announcements, nobody hears them. That, that is a safety issue. Uh, the other, I will tell you that nobody knows what time it is at several parts of that school because the clocks don't work. It may be good for the teachers, I'm not sure. But Darius, you want to speak on that? So this, so this is part of our overall capital planning. So as you know, last year we brought forward to you to order to take a loan for $1.8 million. The town's actually not going to be assessed on that loan until 22 or 23. We, we delayed the process on those capital projects. Um, we're starting to move forward on the track and such. So um, the way we take the loan, the actual, the, the bill will not be due until we're trying, I'm trying to push it off the 23 if possible um, because obviously we're looking at the, uh, the, the revenue shortage coming down from the state. So those, those projects are being pushed off. Um, these capital projects are coming out of a capital committee made up of school committee members and select board members from each town. Um, and these particular things, we have doors in the high school that we can't prop open because of fire hazard, but I can't get a handicapped student through in the hallway. So that's what's happening there and obviously the clocks. There is a very good chance that we will be back in school with some sort of normalcy in, um, in September. The state is going to be releasing its um, information early next week about what schools can look like and what's going to have to follow in guidelines and getting students back into the buildings is going to be a priority. Um, I know that's going to, people are going to want to know what that's going to look like and the safety beyond that. Um, and as we have committees doing stuff working on that, um, but those are kind of things. So we are putting money into our schools because we hope to be back in them. There is also a chance that there's a rebound and will be, um, there'll be a separation, but this is a project that has to get done unless we're never going back to school, which I don't think is going to be the case. Thank you, Darius. Hang on, we got somebody over here first. If we're gonna give one employee a raise, for God's sakes, fund your kids. Okay, go ahead. I'm not saying, I'm, what I'm saying is, if our kids are going back to school in a pandemic, are we asking for enough money to provide them a safe environment? So it might be a fire door or it might be a clock, but if we're talking about perspex and masks and PPE and all of this stuff, I want us to seriously consider we might not be asking for enough here. Well, I guess all we can do is leave it up to the people who drew up the budget. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Um, but I guess the other information was probably helpful too. But the, um, yes, I'm very concerned about the, num the, the cost of PPEs and all the additional costs it's gonna take to take, bring kids back in the building. Um, we are looking at different grants and stuff that, from the state that's gonna pay for it. Um, the school committee passed a resolution uh, to ask the state to make sure they fund all these um, unfunded mandates to protect students and teachers in the building. So I am very worried. I'm also very worried about the finances of, of all, We did a, we did a big you know, if things are, um, from the local level, from the elementary school, the, the region's going to have to deal with it in other ways. Fortunately, the schools are in a good financial shape overall. Um, we were saving up to do some of these capital projects without going to the towns, um, but we're saving some of those things in our reserves, our free cash, um, even at Frontier. To Extremely impressed with the efforts and uh, hard work going in. Teacher,
going middle of okay all right i i i don't think she really said anything about the money part of this she was just commenting on how they have a plan set up and in place and hopefully everything will work out anything else on the monies okay All right, I think we're done on this one anyways. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Article 5. $240,000 from the capital stabilization account to the general fund to replace a six-wheel highway truck, the current truck to be traded in. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Any discussion? Right there. Okay. Yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris Rose, uh, Whaley Road. Uh, I want to know what truck are we trading in? Uh, why it needs to be two hundred and forty thousand dollars? That seems like an excessive amount for a six-wheel dump truck. And what happened to the trade from the last truck that we purchased for two hundred thousand last year? Two full questions from uh, one of the select. Okay, can we get a response for those two questions? Mr. Armstrong. So when, when Ron took over as uh, the head of the road crew, we had old trucks. These are the, the big six wheel, big trucks, heavy duty trucks. And we needed to buy some new trucks and Ron told us that the, the uh, climate systems in these trucks that, that, that these trucks had uh, so they, they obey emissions were terrible. And he, and he said, I'm gonna try to put off as long as I can from buying any new trucks. And so we didn't buy any new trucks right up until last year. So last year was the first year that we bought a new truck, a new one of these, we replaced one of these big trucks. And all that time, Ron kept these old trucks going and all of them need to be replaced. We have four big trucks. Now, this is the second one. They all need to be replaced. We're going to be replacing the rest of them over the next few years. Can you address what happened to the last truck that they got I rid don't of? know. Ron would have to answer that. It got traded in for the purchase of the new truck. And the difference in the money between 200000 for the last truck and the $240,000 for the new truck is because when I purchased the last truck, I'm using sander from what we already had that we were reusing the sander and a few other things that I've been trying to work out so everything comes together. But the price of everything has been going up so fast that I had to ask for more money so that I can outfit the new truck to do what the highway department needs it to do. Truck. That was the question. I don't want to know. Do, about do we have Do we have that information? The trade-in value of the last truck you got traded in. The last truck, the value we got five thousand dollars for. Five thousand dollars. In the back. Heidi Flanders, 112 Maple. I was wondering if somebody could tell us how much free cash we have before we end again. Okay, do we know how much free cash the town has currently? Um, well, we've already, uh, we, we just spent 25800 uh, But going into this town meeting, we have uh, $497,000, roughly, a little more. And, and, uh, we'll have 
plenty after this town meeting is over also to roll over to next year, which is a good practice. It depends on what passes and what doesn't pass at the town meeting, but it could be, um, it could be $200,000 to roll over. Yes. Two collections. Right up front here. From Shelburne Falls Road. Can everyone hear me? Okay, that's okay. Use the mic. Um, I think it would be prudent to defer a decision of $240,000 on in November. Uh, as I'm okay have on our budget, ultimately, a discretionary expenditure would have to this money right now. It's the road. Okay. Malcolm? Well, I guess one of my questions was answered. So it was, I was year with everything else being frozen and uh, I just don't think it's, it's necessary. I, I make a motion that that we forego buying the truck this year and the way his help is quitting him I don't know he's got enough people to drive it anyway. Well, we, we've already got a motion on the floor that we're going to deal with and that will deal with your motion anyways. Okay. So. Do we have any other discussion? That one over here. So town meeting can vote to defer any action on purchasing this truck. The truck that's being replaced is something on the order of over 23 years old. I think it's a 1997 vehicle. It takes understandable given the circumstances to November the reality is even if you approve purchase of this truck today you're not going to even see it on the road till late 2021 or 2022 and you're using a vehicle right now that's over 23 years old for your roads okay we ready to vote on this all those in favor of article 5 is written Signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? A simple majority vote, correct? Okay, the ayes definitely have that. This article five was two thirds. The motion was from free cash? Article 5 no, says to see if the raise and appropriate transfer from available funds or otherwise provide 240000 And what was the motion? Capital stabilization. Which is a two-thirds vote. Capital stabilization. Okay. Let's do this one more time. It's got to be two-thirds vote. Yeah. No, I, no, I said no. I said capital stabilization. Listening, and I wrote it down. You, it's, say you said free cash. It's right here. I respectfully disagree. So, you okay. can do. We can do a new vote, but the motion you made was free cash. All right. Let me make the motion again. Okay. The motion is uh, to transfer two hundred forty thousand from the capital stabilization account, which is what I said originally, to the general fund to replace a six-wheel highway truck 
the current truck to be traded in. Okay, same motion, same vote. It's got to be two-thirds. All those in favor of purchasing a six-wheel highway truck for 240000 out of capital, capital stabilization, stabilization signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Do we, want to, do we want to take the time to count it? It's a little hot in here and we've got a long way to go. All right, let me have my counters. I'm still going to be, you're still going to be counting. I need my four counters up here. We'll split it right here. Come on up. Okay, you guys are going to have that half. You two have that half. Okay, you ready? Okay. Don't worry about my vote. Okay. Keep your arms up high with your yellow card so the counters can see them. Those in favor, signal, raise your hands for eyes. All right, those opposed, raise your yellow card. 44, got it, okay.
All right, let's do this again on this half of the room. If you're against this article, raise your hands high, please, and keep them up. All right, keep them up. Keep them up. Not even close. It's not even it's not even close we're, we're, we're gonna go with your highest number and it's not even close okay we're gonna give you guys the benefit of the doubt on that half because we had discrepancy there by one vote every time so we got hundred and two in favor we have 33 opposed, so it carries. Okay, the good news is, I believe Article 6 has been passed over. All those in, we have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of passing over, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Article 7. I move we pass over Article 7. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 8. I move we pass over Article 8. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 9. I move that the town transfer $150,000 from free cash to the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund. Do we have a second? Okay, we're open for discussion on Article 9. Any questions? Okay, we're ready to vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? It carries. Article 10. I move that the town transfer $122,700 from the Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund to the General Fund for the following equipment. 
for the highway department, $50,000 for a bucket loader. For the fire department, $42,700 for self-contained breathing apparatuses. For the highway department, $30,000 for a compact loader. We got a motion. Do I hear a second? Got a second. Okay, this, this is going to require two thirds. Okay, uh, do we have any discussion? Any questions? Hang on, hang on. Can't hear you. They're not, they don't want me yet. You guys got your Fitbits on today? <laughs> Sorry, hi. Gary Fenton again, Roaring Brook. Could the Finance Committee explained why they voted this down four to nothing. Thank you for asking. The Finance Committee at this point voted because of the, we were really unsure of the outlook of the budget at the time. And for these items, which were not so crucial, we really wanted to defer the vote since we're of the opinion that we now, now we're not going to have it, but a later town meeting when we have a lot more certainty about our budget picture, including the, what a level of free cash will be, what our borrowing limits would be. And that's the reason we were at this point voted to uh, say no. So they punted. <laughs> okay. Mr. Moderator, I would highly recommend that you separate these three votes out separately in the jeopardy of the fire department apparatus equipment account for self-contained breathing apparatus that is badly needed by the fire department. And I don't want it to be jeopardized by town equipment. Does, it, does the uh, body want to separate these out? Okay, let me see a show of hands. Who wants to separate it? Who wants to vote it as a whole? Okay, we'll separate it out. Okay. First thing, highway, bucket loader, $50,000. You want to speak on that? Anybody? I will. Go ahead. So we've had a similar discussion the last couple of years at these town meetings over how we're going to replace vehicles. And there are vehicles that if we trade them in on time, we can get a lot of money back for them. So this is a perfect example of that. This vehicle is not ancient. It's not worn out. We can get a lot of money for it. Ron thinks he can replace it for $50,000, and I believe that sounds like a good deal. We can hold on to it for a bunch more years. We won't have any trade-in value. We, can, we have to do all the repairs on it. They get real expensive, and uh, that's the way the town's been doing it for a long time. Now, we've had this discussion at town meeting a number of times. We can have a long discussion about it again, but in general, town meeting has supported this idea of trading in certain pieces of equipment early enough that we can get good value for it. That's what this item is about. And this was supported by the capital improvements? Yes. Okay. How old is the bucket loader? 15, 2015. 2015, so it's f five. How much is it worth? Can't hear him. What's it worth? A new loader is about $200,000, and I'm asking for $50,000 to replace it. Did you hear that? I heard, I heard then, that. I would like to make the motion we ought to keep it for a while. We have a motion already on the floor. So if he, did everybody hear the values? A new one's worth about $200,000 to buy new. Okay, the, they figure they can buy and replace what they've got for fifty. dollars It'll be six years old by the time you trade it. Okay, we ready to vote on this? Okay, we got another question. Matt, that ain't working. It is working. Kenny, I was on the Capital Finance Committee. I drew up those replacement plans for 10 years. I had engineers do that. I don't know what happened to all that, but I had... I went around, I had po the power company involved. You remember all that. What happened to all that? I couldn't begin to tell you. Ten years is the norm. Ten years. Yeah. Uh, two comments about this. One, it, again, with uh, potential variables, concerns about our budget after November. 
Uh, this is a discretionary expense. Two, I'd like to know how many hours are on this machine, not, not how old it is, how many hours are on the machine and how that compares. You know, it, if this machine has $150,000 in value to someone else, it's worth $150,000 to us. So I, I, don't, I doubt that this needs to be replaced at this time. Do we have a number of hours on the machines? 3,000 3, hours, okay. Okay, I have no idea. <laughs> if I had to work it, it's a lot. But other than that, I don't know. Um, are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of replacing the highway bucket loader for $50,000, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Yay. Well, that's a needs a two-thirds. Okay, on to the next one. Fire equipment, $42,700. Anybody want to speak on that? Mr. Baker. This uh, breathing your apparatus. Go ahead, you got it. You okay. sure? Yeah, I got it. Okay. This breathing apparatus is being replaced or has to be replaced because it's going on 20 years old. These are self-contained breathing apparatus that are required by all firefighters to go into burning structures or smoke-filled houses or anything that has smoke on it and we create it, we create it when we go to a fire. Last year, I agreed with the Finance Committee and the Selectmen. We asked for one request for the whole, all the items, and they asked me if we'd be willing to break it in half. And I came back to them at the time, I said, it's hard to break it in half because one truck has more pieces of breathing apparatus on it than the second truck does. So they agreed to give me the money last year to replace the first truck that had the more breathing apparatus under the assumptions that the tech would bring it up for vote again this year to finish the other half. What happens right now is we have some equipment that is up to date with 4.5 uh, pressure tanks and the other four pieces of equipment on the other truck are only 2.2s. It's a little bit confusing to the firefighters because there's huge difference in the size of these packs. I would highly recommend it to the taxpayers at this time. Please vote for us. Thank you. Okay, we have any questions about the... Uh, Alan Singer, Finance Committee Chair. We actually, uh, in this, when we had a meeting of the finance, just the Finance Committee, had suggested that the uh, fire department requests be separate from the highway department because they're separate and inherently different. Thank you. And uh, so uh, if we were to take up an up and up vote now, I would certainly recommend it. But we were told that we had a vote on it as a package overall. Thank you. Any other questions? In the back. Um, Bob? Bob, somewhere over there. I was just curious as to how old these smaller pieces of equipment are and how long we've actually had them? The, uh, the place, packs that we placed last year were 15 years old. This year, these being replaced will be 16 years old. And it, it's, it's the same type of thing. You don't, when you order them, you don't get them right away. Sometimes it's up to six to eight months before you get them. Everybody hear that? 15 to 16 years old. Okay, any other questions? We ready to vote? All those in favor of spending $42,700 for fire equipment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. okay, third article, a compact loader, $30,000. Somebody speak on that. Bob? So this is the same deal again. We have a piece of equipment, it's not terribly old. The town can decide they don't like this program of trading equipment in early. Yeah, you can say it's got a lot of life left in it, and it does. It's got a lot of maintenance costs left in it. These things get old. Ron is proposing to us that we trade them in before we put a lot of money into maintenance. He can get good value for them, and we buy a new piece of equipment. You can decide you like to do this, or you don't like to do this. So the, the, uh, 
the Capital Improvement Committee supported Ron in the plan that he's putting forward, and we thought this was a good, good deal. Okay, any questions? Oh, over here. Yeah, going over here. Ron Hawks, I just wondering if all the attachments that we have for the current machine are going to be used on the new one, or if we're going to buy all new attachments. Ronnie, can you address that? Okay. Everybody understand that all the attachments that we currently have that fit the existing machine will fit the proposed new machine. The same question um, is about the, the bucket loader. Uh, how old is the machine and how many hours on it? It's a 2014 and it has just over a thousand hours. It, one of the reasons is that we've had a lot of issues with the machine under warranty. They've actually replaced the motor. We've had some small oil leaks that get very expensive. It just seemed that the machine has had a lot of issues and that's one of the real reasons why I want to at least get this machine replaced. Oh, it sounds like it's a chronic issue. Okay, any other questions? So just like the last time, this is money coming out of stabilization. It's not coming out of tax money. It's a question if we can do it this year, we can just leave that money in the stabilization account and we will have it to do sometime in the future. It's, but this money can't be used for anything other than buying this piece of equipment. It's not coming out of your taxes. It's not money that we can easily use next year in case we have a pandemic disaster. We have a lot of money in stabilization, but we, in the past we supported this plan of Ron. You can choose to support it or not, but it's not tax money we're talking about. Yeah, we're, uh, we built this building, we're building a garage, and we're getting rid of equipment with a thousand hours on it. We're going in two different directions. Okay, do we have any other, any other questions? Ready to vote? Two-thirds vote. All those in favor of getting the, replacing the compact loader, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Well, that's certainly not a two-thirds aye. Okay. Article 11. Transfer $38,416 from the OPED trust fund to the general fund to pay other post-employment benefits, retiree health insurance, and to transfer $10,000 from free cash to the OPEB trust fund. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Any discussion? Any explanation? Tom? Uh, you may notice this has two parts to it. The first is taking money from the other post-employment benefit trust fund that the town set up and has been paying into to pay other post-employment benefits. This is one of the ways that we've reduced uh, Article 2, the operating budget, this year. This is probably not something that we would do frequently. Uh, but that's, that's one of the ways we've, we've reduced the operating budget. The other part of it is to put a little bit money back in because that uh, we should always be putting a little bit more money back into this so that if we're in this situation we can pull it out and so that when we uh, go to borrow money the banks look at us and they say, okay, you're, you're aware of this situation and you're addressing it. So those are the two aspects to this article. Okay, we're ready to vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed? Article 12. I move that the town transfers $27,693 from free cash to the ambulance department operating budget. Okay, we got a motion and a second. 
Do we have an? Do we need an explanation? No. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed. Okay. Article 13. I move that the town transfer $27,435 from free cash to the general fund for partial debt service for the highway garage. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Heidi Flanders, 112 Maple Street. I was wondering if you could explain to me how this is different from the $69,000 you asked for in Article 2, Line 751. They seem to say the same thing, but I'm, I'm unsure of, of what the difference is. It's not here. Do you want to handle that one? Is Jan here? I'm here. Can you address that, or do you want Tom to? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. When we explained the borrowing to the town, we made a proposal that um, somebody named Joe Stragowski thought of. I don't know. Has anybody here ever heard of him? Um, and that was that we could lower the long-term tax burden on the town, which is what you see in 751, by supplementing it with a little bit of free cash every year. And the figure that we chose was what we're paying in item 751 is as though we'd already paid down 10 years of the debt. And the way we're, that we, we propose to do that and what this is the result of is taking um, some money out of free cash and using that to supplement the debt payment. And that money is going to go down over 10 years, but it evens out the amount that we're paying in debt. So uh, that's why we're doing it that way. It's to stabilize your taxes and, uh, and, and uh, provide two sources of funding rather than one in order to do that. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I think it's about time somebody stood up and explained what free cash is. It's not free. And I don't believe 90% of the people in this room don't realize what free cash is. So I would like our leader over there to explain it, Mr. Tom. Tom uh, Malcolm, to explain to everybody what exactly free cash comes from. Free cash is made up of a number of sources, the majority of which is items that don't get spent from the previous year's budget. So if somebody comes in under budget, that goes into free cash. Uh, other, there are other things that go into free cash as well. Uh, they're generally much smaller amounts, miscellaneous revenues, and uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there could be dozens of them, but they're, they're not the majority of it. The majority of it is money that's left over from the previous year. Tom, where does license fees and fees coming from the state go to? Which, which account? Jan, they, does that go to free cash? Okay. So, yeah, it depends. That's a broad question. Okay, all right. I can, don't want to confuse it. I can talk if you want. No? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions on that? We ready to vote? Article 13 on the partial debt service. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 14. I move that the town transfer $23,300 from free cash to the general fund for radio equipment for the police, fire, and ambulance departments. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All ready to speak on that. I'm so glad you didn't. <laughs> Article 15. I move that the town transfer $11,040 from free cash to the general fund for 
first year of software conversion for the treasurer collector. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Hang on, coming. Just out of curiosity, will this conversion in the long run save us all some money? So yes, it does. It saves us a significant amount of money. For the next two years, it will save us 3,500 each year. And by the uh, fourth year and ongoing, it'll save us 5,000. So this company has just, um, it, the company we use now has exchanged hands and the support costs have just gone up way too high, so it's time to leave them. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Article 16. I move that the town transfer $5,000 from free cash to the general fund for an annual contribution to the assessor's five-year reevaluation program. We got a motion. Did I hear a second? And a second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 17. I move that the town transfer $5,000 from free cash to the grant match fund. Got a motion? And a second. Now this says two thirds vote. Uh, sorry, that shouldn't. No. It should Majority. not? No. Okay, Majority, Majority vote. Uh, but I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, there was 20000 in the in the grant match fund. I uh, dedicated 15000 of that to a grant which is being put together for South River uh, climate change mitigation strategies. Uh, the highway department also dedicated $5,000 to that for culvert work. It's part of the same grant. So it's being used for its intended purpose. Uh, again, because of the uncertainty in, in revenues, uh, I changed from requesting uh, fully replenishing it, which would be $15,000, to just $5,000 to bring it up to $10,000, uh, half of its original uh, size. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, Article 18. I move that the town transfer $4,500 from free cash to the general fund for software conversion for the Board of Assessors. Motion and a second. Any discussion needed? All right, this is the last year she's asking for money. All those in favor? Opposed? Article 19. I move that the town transfer $2,641 from free cash to the general fund for helping ensure accreditation for the Field Memorial Library. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Malcolm? Which article, which article are you on now? Article 19. Okay, I thought it sounded like you was on 20. Nope. Okay, yeah, all right. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 20. I move that the town appropriate or reserve for later appropriation monies from the Community Preservation Fund with each item considered a separate appropriation as follows. Are we going to vote on these separately? I believe we will. Okay. All right, I'll do, I'll do them separately. Okay. A appropriate, appropriate $115,854 from the unreserved fund balance for preservation of the Field Memorial Library to include upgrading the heating system, interior lighting, dome repairs, both interior and exterior, and multiple interior restoration projects. Okay, we have a motion and a second. 
Any discussion or explanation? Mr. Baker? Does this fund for $115,000 require the town to put a lien on the library property like we did the Congregational Church? No. Okay. We're looking for a re response from somebody on the committee. It does to an extent, and the library people know this. This will pass, I'm sure, but before the money is spent, there has to be an agreement drawn up for the town of Conway to protect the funds that are going into the library. It don't have to be as technical as the church was, because that got overblown. And I think the library committee understands this. Thank mm -hmm. you. I am Mary McClintock. I live on South Deerfield Road, and I'm on the um, Conservation Preservation Committee. Does somebody have the, f it's really helpful when we do this kind of voting to know what is in each of the funds. Um, so if we are saying we're taking out 115 for this or something for that from this one, it's good to know Plenty this is all money that we've got in these Plenty. different pots in the Community Preservation Fund. How much is in each of the pots? Do you have that information for us? I do. As, as listed on the town website, we currently have historic preservation, $45,113. In open space, we have $76,840. In housing, we have $113,161. In unreserved, we have $712,321. So we got a lot of money. Yep. Howard. Howard Boyden from across the road, also the chairman of the Field Memorial Library Trustees. Um, in 1901, Marshall Field bequested a gift to the town of Conway in memory of his parents, and that is the Field Memorial Library that we have now. He also then and then later on, members of the family put money in to a trust fund to keep the Field Memorial Library memorial in good shape. Okay, and in our bylaws, we are directed to maintain the memorial first at the expense of the library if it comes to that. It's been almost 120 years and she needs a little work. And I commend, I, I have to say, I, I commend any of the administrators that are in charge of big buildings like Frontier Regional and whatnot for bringing forward capital items in a timely manner so that we don't end up with something that cost us too much to replace or that we have to replace entirely. What we're looking to do here at the library is keep water from coming in when it rains change the heating system over to a radiant heated system, which with propane, we can use 97% of every BTU we burn put into that building. Right now, we're heating with forced hot air and oil, and the very best we can do with that system is 80%. 20% of the BTUs that are produced by that oil are going up the chimney. Radiant heat is the way they've been using on stone buildings in Europe for a lot longer than we have. We're slow to catch on. We've done an experimental one-third of the library out of our own pocket. It's working phenomenally well, much, much more comfortable and less energy going in. So we would like to do the remaining two-thirds. That's part of it. So we want to keep the water out. We want to update the heating system, which will be better for the library as well as for the memorial. And then there's, there's doors that are rotting out down back that need replacing and just a myriad of small things that we can peck away at a little at a time. But it, we were actually asked by many people in the town of Conway to please ask for a grant 
from the, from the uh, historic preservation grant from the CPA so that you could get it done in a timely manner. We do have some, some reserves, and I'll tell you what, we have reduced them by $100,000 in the last 10 years, nickel and diming and doing what we thought we could do. So it really is up to the town of Conway if you would like us to continue to maintain this beautiful icon in the center of town, which I am incredibly proud of. That said, um, and thank you, Howard, for all that information, we must remember that this is still not owned by the town. So while I am going to totally vote for this, we need to be careful that our CPA monies are used properly. And even though this is probably within that scope, obviously, if it's on here, um, we don't want to get involved in giving monies to things that happen to be in town but are not owned by the town. Would the town really like to own it? <laughs> um, I, I'd no. be more than happy to share what we have no. done in the last 10 years. Um, I don't think the town owned the old grammar school either um, when we put a roof on that with this money. There's a couple of things I'd like to say in regards to this. Number one is we have a full schedule of what's to be done and who had actually bid to do the work. And those, those items are all going to be done by Conway residents. And I think that's to say quite a lot for the Field Malora Library. Uh, I know we need to have a draft drawn up to protect the funds. But the draft, the, the agreement that was drawn up with the church was so complicated that Nobody really understood it, not even the town council, because he signed off on it, and it was just a bunch of foolishness, 90% of it. And I have told Howard, and I have so, told uh, the other fellow who lives all right, my so way, what, what that are we, doing we do need doing some now. kind of a document to protect the funds of the town. And I'm sure that will be done, but we can't delay it too long, because the roof's leaking. That needs to be addressed. Well, All right, with that being said, are we ready to vote? <laughs> okay, this is okay. A, right. this clarification, this is just majority? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, majority vote. Uh, the item A, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. That was easy. Okay, B. I move to appropriate $4,000 from the open space reserve for interpretive nature signs in the pollinator field to be created on the Audubon property at the edge of Route 116. Okay. <clears throat> that's, that's... This is South River Meadow. This says $4,000 from the open space reserve for interpretive, historical, and nature signage in the South in, River in, Meadow. Unless well, there's... It, which is right, Tom? The warrant is right? Okay. All right, let's change that. Okay, so does everybody have a copy? You want me to read it one more time? All right. One more time. All right. B, $4,000 from the open space reserve for interpretive historical and nature signage in the South River Meadow. That is the motion. Do we have a second? Do we have an explanation or discussion? We ready to vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Majority, simple majority? The ayes have mm -hmm. it. C. 
appropriate $14,000 from the open space reserve for updating the open space and recreation plan. We need an explanation. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Anybody know what we're talking about? Somebody want to explain it? Okay. As the non-expert on this, I will try. We need an open space plan so that we can get money to do open space work funded by the state. Otherwise, you get to fund it. Okay. So the state holds us hostage without, uh, you can't get the money? One requirement of getting the money is that you have the plan. Okay. Uh, Betsy Good, Baptist Hill, will there be a public forum uh, for input? Janet Chase, yes, this is a comprehensive seven-year plan that's based on current inventories of detailed inventories of open space recreational facilities and lots of input from the citizens. So absolutely, we uh, look forward to hearing what people want for different recreation uh, uh, and other um, outdoor possibilities. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, D. Appropriate $74,000. 60840 of that from the Open Space Reserve. 13160 from the unreserved fund balance for part of the town match of a $440,000 state grant for Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, MVA, against flooding of the South River. Okay, we got a motion and second. Do we need any explanation? Okay. This, I feel, is just dumping more money into the river so it'll It'll flow down into the Deerfield, but we sure didn't see much, much improvement in the river from the last money we dumped into it. So I oppose it very vigorously, unless we can see some good results and quit the study and get to, to do some work. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this is um, an, one step to get us closer to actually doing some additional remediation flooding projects, including culvert repairs uh, and um, uh, stream bank restoration further down the line. There has been, by the way, can you hear me? Yeah. Significant improvement as a result of the projects already completed. The restored floodplain fills with water whenever there is heavy rain. And and the boulders deflect some of the current, and uh, it is working, and it is a success. This is a 16-mile river with lots of turns and lots of human alteration over the years, so it's not one simple Band-Aid fix. Uh, this is a significant uh, match opportunity, a lot of state funds here, and it is exactly the kind of um, opportunity that the CPA monies are helpful for. Janet, you just said 16 mile river? The whole river between Ashford and Swamp. Okay. Just want to make sure we didn't have 16 miles of that river in Conway because no. I was missing it. Okay, any other discussion? Tom? Just to mention that uh, in most cases, in order to get a grant, the town has to provide some kind of a match. That's what this is. Does this $440,000 state grant allow us to use some of the money to do work on the river itself, or is it all eaten up by Council of Governments and everybody else to put little plans together and we end up with nothing. 
Can anybody answer that? Yes, we're going to end up with bid-ready plans. You, people who studied, worked on the highway, uh, garage, or anything else, there's a lot of engineering and permitting. We will end up with five bid-ready plans, and those options are selected with a lot of in-town people. This is Loudmouth Malcolm again. I see what, what we're after here is to supplement the town's budget. And the CPA fund never was meant to supplement the town's budget. And I know Janet gave me a whole list of towns that had done this, and I called up some of them towns, and they said they never happened. I said, what would you do if it did happen? We'd make them pay it back to the CPA fund. So you can do as you please, but I don't think this is correct. People in this room, Janet does, on the committee for a while, understands what the regulations are with the CPA fund. And it's time that somebody, including the selectman, studied and found out the information on it because she did a terrible thing here a while ago. She ran in at the selectman, had them sign off on these programs, and they had no business of doing that. I don't fault them because they're all green in regards to this work. They're all new selectmen, so to speak. I've been on this program ever since it started 19 years ago in the town of Conway. Thank you very much. Okay. We Go ahead, Janet. Then let's vote on this. Briefly, I, I do uh, respect and appreciate Malcolm for all his work he's done on this over the years. In this particular case, Malcolm, I think you're getting this article uh, confused with the other one, which is for the open space plans. And that was the question where I found out from the state website that at least 30 towns had used those money. For this, for a major, for a river restoration remediation. It's a perfect, legitimate, and often used uh, resource for towns throughout the Commonwealth. Okay, we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of Section D of Article 20 signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. E. Appropriate $250,000 from the unreserved fund balance for safety and accessibility improvements to the playground at the Conway Grammar School. We got a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? So, uh, John Lockhead in um, Reedsbridge Road. I want you to just look at this building. Uh, it took us over 20 years to build it because we kept going out to high-priced consultants who came back with estimates that the town thought were far too high for a building of this sort. And eventually, we did the work in the town without the consultants. The highway department actually did a lot of the work in preparing for the building and has done some of the work for the next building that's coming up. Um, I think this place structure is just far too expensive. I don't think that enough work has been done to look into lower priced alternatives. The, the school committee went out or whatever group went out, got a consultant to tell them what it would cost and that's the same thing we had with this building and I think the town was wise to wait 20 years and get this building at a reasonable price. I think we don't need to wait 20 years to get the play structure, but I think we need to use the model that was used for this structure for how we proceed. Okay. We can, uh, does the body want to recognize the principal of the grammar school? smell because it kind of freaks me out a little. And I know people can't hear me unless I get up close. So hi, I'm Kristen Gordon, principal of Conway Grammar School. Um, I want you to know that this was not the road that we were planning on going down. Um, 
under our, if you go by the swings over by the playground, the pads underneath are just worn to the ground. And so we started with trying to get some est estimates on the pads under the swings. And as we looked further into it, we've, we've really got a mess over there that you, you wouldn't really notice with your eye or driving by or even um, walking by for that matter. First of all, the, if you look at the pre uh, preschool playground, the la there's stairs that go up and then there's absolutely no slide that goes down. Um, approximately half of this money is surface money. And so the ground, the fall zones on the playground are just terrible. Um, this is, these are times when children break, their, break bones, literally, if they fall because there's not a soft service underneath. I haven't done a playground project, although I've been an administrator for a long time, I haven't done a playground project in over 15 years, so we were quite surprised by the prices as well, and we have looked at many prices. So I just want to tell you what this price would include. It wouldn't just include the play structure. Um, the, um, bounce, the, sorry, the bounce play equipment, they don't meet ADA requirements and pinch hazard and the, broken, the slide is broken and the play service doesn't meet um, ADA compliance or safety. So you have different zones on the playground where they're, they're fall zones, the swings, the slide, various other places, and they just don't meet safety or ADA guidelines. The swings don't meet ADA guidelines, uh, safety regulations, and are heavily corroded. So the surface, again, doesn't ma meet the ADA or safety guidelines. The asphalt surface has many cracks trip hazards and doesn't meet the regulations. Safety services require, uh, that require daily maintenance to meet the ADA regulations. The monkey bars and safety surface under the monkey, monkey bars don't meet safety or ADA requirements. The accessible root areas doesn't meet ADA slope regulation. Um, if you're a child with, with a physical disability, there's very little you can access safely on that playground. Um, the idea is to remove the monkey brown bars with a new net climber for 2- to 12-year-old children with a rubber surface, remove the bounce play equipment, remove the slide, a new play smart system with a rubber surface, remove the swings, new swings um, with a variety of seats, meeting the needs of all children, even children with physical disabilities, and a rubber surface, mill and remove asphalt uh, paving, new rubber surface, um, Close to half of that, that amount, the total amount was a little over $300,000, and close to half of that is just for surface. Um, about $80,000 is actually for the play equipment, and uh, about $12,000 for the demolition. Um, but drainage improvement, asphalt replane, repaving, rubber safety surface, um, and pulling that up is about half of that money. And so we're just not looking at that play structure, we're looking at the entire playground. And again, this isn't a road that we were really going down. Um, and once it was brought to our attention, it was sort of, gee, we really need to get moving on this and, and we really need to do something about it because it's really about safety and ADA regulations, which were out of compliance. And I, I just wanted to mention, the reason we went to the CPA is that the, one of the reasons for the CPA funding, which is already there, one part of that is recreation. And I, I can't think of any better recreation project than for that of the children in Conway. And all of the children use that playground. That playground's used from literally 8.30 in the morning until about 6.30 at night when our programs end and then after as well. Okay. Here. <clears throat> Lynn Hanley, Shelburne Falls Road. I just wondered why this isn't in the school budget. So as you can see, budgets are going to probably look much like a nightmare, and um, we didn't want to add any more to the school budget, and we were, thinking, we were looking at pots of money that we could possibly apply for. And after doing some research, uh, many other districts use CPA funding f money for parts of their playground projects, which is why we went the CPA route. If we put this money in our budget, as you, as you 
would obviously know we wouldn't be looking at um, a level funded budget, a zero increase. Paulette Lovechuck, Matthews Road. Um, I'm a teacher at the school, and I was on the committee uh, with Kristen and some other teachers, and when we started at the playground, we were looking at certain areas that need to be done, and when we had a consultant come in, it was obvious that there was a lot that was not com safety or ADA compliant. It's not accessible for certain um, students or members of the community also use that much beyond school hours. The newer structure that you see there will remain. And I know if people had questions about that, because that's, that's in good shape, they said. So those things that are not safety or compliant need to be replaced. And as Kristen said, the surface area. And if you take a look at it, you can see how that would not be safe or compliant. Thank you. Um, I am all for safety and compliance for all of our kids. It's wonderful. I'm wondering in this time of COVID whether I'm hearing so much about surfaces being a big part of the monies used, if you've recently taken into consideration any adjustments based on COVID. Malcolm. Answer to what? Malcolm, you had your hand up? Yeah. No, I don't have an answer, but I just wanted to clear the air a little bit about this school business. All of a sudden, one day, I got a call from the school, and then, and I guess uh, I got the wrong person, but they said, we hear you got some money to give away. And so that's where it all started, which didn't suit me too well. And then when it came to a meeting, about 15 of them from the school barged into the meeting unannounced, and I made a statement as to who's the girl in the wheelchair, and now I'm an asshole because I said that. And all I wanted to know was they should have come in and introduced themselves. And, you know, I think it's a lot of money. And the last time anything was done down there it was done with volunteers. I'm not, a, I'm not a bit opposed to spending some money there, but... I'll talk about that a little later on as I close because I got plans for some of that money in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, any other discussion? If the money for this comes from the CPA, that's funds we already have set aside. If it comes out of the school budget, it increases the, it increases the tax pay. We have to pay taxes to pay for it. Does that answer your question on the why does it not come out of the school budget? Okay. I move the question. All right, we're done. We're, I guess we're done discussing this. Let's let's move this. All those in favor of E. $250,000 for the grammar school playground. Signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The majority of the ayes have it. F. Appropriate $50,000 from the unreserved fund balance for conservation of the McLeish Stone House. Got a motion. And a second. Any explanation? Here we go. Who wants to who wants to answer? Anybody? Okay. First of all, I'd like to ask a question. Is Carl Viglin here? He, he was here. I talked to him when I first got here. Why don't we let him answer it? Let him, I'll let him. Okay, we'll have to that. vote as a body to let a non-resident speak. Carl was a resident, but he left us. <laughs> Do 
Do we want to let Carl speak? Yes. yes. Go ahead, Carl. Thanks very much. Is this working? My name is Carl Vigelon. I spent 20 of the happiest years of my life here in Conway. And uh, then- Carl, can you be closer to the mic? Hi. Should I? Can you hear me now? Yep. My name is Carl Vigelon. I spent 20 years of the happiest years of my life in Conway and then moved down to the big city of Amherst. But I'm here today as a representative of the Archibald McLeish Collection at Greenfield Community College, which has been working with the Franklin Land Trust, your CPC committee, your historical commission, and um, uh, other people in, in town, um, as well as the present owners of the property who are going to donate it to the Franklin Land Trust. Uh, presently, the McLeish Stone House, which was Archibald McLeish's studio, sits on a beautiful pasture uh, on, on Pine Hill Road near the former McLeish home. It was over 90 years ago when Mr. McLeish moved here to Conway and in 1930 uh, had the stone house built, which became his studio. And it, over the next 50 years, uh, he, re he achieved a worldwide literary uh, fame. He was also a public figure, a public servant among other things, in the cabinet of, of President Roosevelt. Um, and he always came back to Conway, uh, where he wrote works that, among other things, earned him three Pulitzer Prizes. The building sits on about two acres, which is, I, which is owned presently by a couple named Bill and Liv Bloomer. They are making a donation of the building and the property on which it sits, about two acres, to the Franklin Land Trust, which will serve as a public as, as the custodian of, the, of, of this and also oversee the renovation of the building, which is built of stone, which, thus its name, but it needs considerable work, everything from the chimney to the walls, which are also made of field stone, to the floors, the windows, the door, um, and the site itself needs work, among other things, to make public access uh, egress uh, much, much easier. This will eventually become not only uh, an, an historical uh, a, a, a landmark, uh, possibly we hope to become a, a national historic landmark, representative not just of Mr. McLeish's achievement, but of an era that is certainly past with writers today spending most of their time at Starbucks. But it will also become an amenity for the town, a place where people can have picnics, walk their dogs, uh, just go up and meditate. Um, and. Um, the work on it will also include extensive uh, landscaping so that we can open up the wonderful view that Mr. McLeish had from the window within the building. And um, as I said, we will be working, we have been working already with the CPC. I'd like to especially thank Malcolm Course for making the suggestion when we first started talking about this to be sure that the building stayed in its site because its, its site is part of its, part of its histo hist history. Um, it's very striking. Um, I also want to thank Sarah Williams, the chair of the Historical Commission, with whom I met a couple years ago when everyone on the commission came up and looked at the building with me. I've also talked with Peter Engelman, the president of the Historical Society, and I'm happy to announce as well that the Friends of the McLeish uh, Collection, which is the largest collection of McLeish material in the world outside of what is at Yale University and the Library of Congress, um, we'll also be donating money to help with the maintenance over the years. We've recently received a $5,000 gift uh, expressly for, for such purpose. And we feel that this will be, uh, as I say, not only an amenity for the town, but a way of recognizing uh, a, a, a world famous literary figure and public servant and will bring further renown to the town. I should also add that Mr. McLeish's grandparents on his mother's side were the people that brought him to Conway in a sense. His, his uh, maternal grandfather was the pastor of the church that was uh, destroyed in the tor tornado. So there's, there are many, many different uh, aspects to the way this connects to the town history and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hang on, hang, hang on Trish. First, I'd like to thank the members of the Community Preservation Committee for their work. I'm delighted that this building is going to be preserved. It's up the street from my house. 
I also donate to the Franklin Land Trust. I could not be more opposed to allocating town funds to this project. This is private property and public money is being used for it. And unless, if you go to the CPC website, it says that public funds should not be used for private property except if they serve a historic purpose. And certainly, there's probably very few historic buildings in town that the McLeish property isn't uh, qualifying for historic purposes. However, the state website also says if a community wants to allocate public funds to private property, it should have a historic preservation deed restriction with it, and it should have perpetual public use and public access. So if you want to approve public funds that will immediately be transferred to the Franklin Land Trust, a wonderful nonprofit organization that may, within its own funds, make all these improvements instead of our 50,000, that could be considered. But before you approve, if you're inclined to approve these funds, don't leave here today without doing it contingent upon a written agreement that says there will be a deed restriction for historic preservation in the town of Conway's name with public access in perpetuity if that property transfers. We can't continue to allocate CPC money to private property on a wink and a nod without any written agreements beforehand. The Massachusetts Constitution prevents private, public monies going to private land. There's an anti-aid agreement in the Constitution that says if you do allocate public money to private land, have a historic deed preservation, have public access guaranteed in perpetuity. That is what the CPC website advises communities. That is what I've seen in communities that I work for. Do not approve that article if you're inclined to do so without that restriction today or require the Franklin Land Trust to spend that money themselves. It's been there forever. It's a beautiful property, but make sure the town of Conway has control. Are you, are you implying an amendment is in order? We did that. I have something to say in regards to this, if you don't mind. Okay, go ahead. You got a re response? I really didn't want that brought up today because I see that whoever that lady is over there, I didn't get her name. She's done quite a lot of research that I haven't had a chance to do. And we were put on quite a lot of pressure by Mr. Vigeland to get it on the warrant today, in which I didn't think it was necessary. So I'm going to vote no on it until I find out if it can even, even can happen. I don't know if it can happen. I understand she went into the Massachusetts bylaws, but did you go into the CPC bylaws and the historic Massachusetts Historical Society bylaws? There's a lot of things that have to take place before this money can be spent. And along with that, uh, my last comment is going to be, everybody's all helped up about all this money that CPC has. But, you know, down the road a little ways, there's going to be a lot of money wanting want to be spent on the old town garage to make it suitable for a fire truck and the ambulance. And this money can be used for that if we don't blow it all now. Thank you very much. May I add an answer to that, Kenny? Yeah. Go ahead. So the CPA committee, this town, can approve no project on private land that doesn't get us public interest. That would be illegal. We cannot, have not, and will not do that. For any project, including this one, we will have a public interest. In this case, it's open in perpetuity to the public. The Franklin Land Trust is not owning something we don't have access to. They're acting as stewards of something we get access to without buying, but only contributing a small amount to. The small amount is the same as we use to put a cupola on the town hall. 
Here we get a whole building to use forever with its property for our most famous resident. Does that satisfy the, the question you had? No. Mike Haley, Baptist Hill. Uh, no matter what, that property, I, I don't know if half the people in this room even know where it is on Pine Hill. You can't see it. I and mean, more as a question because it's next to the new Taj Mahal, which to honor Mr. McLeish has been redone, let's say. Uh, but it's a stone house. Does this mean parking lots would go in? Does this mean somebody could still live in the house and have people going through the front yard or in the lawn or whatever? You know, it's a, it was his private studio. Uh, and, and there's plenty of things to honor Archibald McLeish in this town. Uh, I don't know why the, the people next door couldn't uh, kick in some money. Uh, it's just, I just don't know. I just think it would change the nature of the situation with that beautiful structure as it is. I'm sure the money can come from somewhere, but uh, when it comes to parking, trash, you know, who's going to be the daily overseer? Um, it just is a very strange thing to me that we're even playing with it. Any other? Hi, if I may just add, uh, without question, I can speak for the Lang Franklin Land Trust, whose director, Tom Curran, would be here today. Uh, he's actually, among other things, a farmer in New Hampshire, where he still lives and has been ordered by his doctor to stay, not in quarantine, but just to stay and not do any travel until the COVID crisis is over. But in terms of the deed restriction, I'm glad that came up. I can speak for the Franklin Land Trust on this. There's no question at all. Uh, the whole thrust behind working with the Franklin Land Trust rather than the town was not to burden the town with the care of this but to work with an institution that would still guarantee that public access to this uh, historic structure would, would be there. And I've had very terrific conversations with Mr. Course about why now. And, uh, you know, life is short. Art is long. Life is short. Uh, the, the, the couple that are donating it are in their 70s. There's no, no guarantee that they'll be around or any of us will be around even tomorrow. And if the building is not preserved, it will eventually become an uh, open field for, for vandals. Uh, I should also add, in terms of the McLeish Collection at Gre Greenfield Community College, which will work with the town, various towns committees to develop programs that can, that, that, that can utilize the site, that the president of the Greenfield Community College, Eve Solomon Fernandez, has personally made a visit out to Conway both to meet with two of the members of the McLeish Friends who live in Conway, George Forcier and Ellen Zale, whose late husband Peter is the former chair of the Preservation Commission, which, which is partly where this project got started, but, but also to, 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 talk, to talk with the owners and to talk with uh, everyone else who was present about what else could be done here. And she's strongly uh, behind uh, in, in the endorsing this project, which means that you, it, it will have the further institutional uh, support of, of what many people think is the finest community college in the Commonwealth. But just to be clear, no, no question at all about the deed restriction. I wouldn't be involved in this if that weren't the case. The whole idea is to make this open for the public. Thank you. Yeah, um, Carl, um, oh, Susan Fenton, Roinbrook Road. Um, Carl, did I understand correctly when you said, is the donation of the land contingent right. upon Conway funding the $50,000? Or has the land and property already been donated to the Franklin Land Trust and we're being asked to contribute to its maintenance and development? Hang on. Great question. It's not so much a matter of contingency as there is no plan B. Um, it, it, it seemed clear to me informally talking with as many people as I could, old friends in Conway, I come up here almost every week to talk with someone or to take another hike, that the last thing that the town needs at this time, 
all towns are dealing with this, of course, in our country is, 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 is the burden of taking care of something else that might be able to be taken care of otherwise. So if this doesn't pass um, and the building is still then owned by the, by the bloomers, I, I can't speak for them. I don't know if they're still here. I know they were planning to come, um, but I don't know if the heat, I, I thought I saw them possibly leaving earlier. Um, I don't know whether they would consider d donating it at that point. If it's donated to the town, that again adds the burden of taking care of it for the town. Um, and no, we've, I've worked with other organizations to see if we, I tried uh, I, I, to have a dialogue with the trustees of reservations about this. I've also talked with people at the Hilltown Land Trust and the Franklin Land Trust just seemed especially suited to this given how many other properties in Conway, not to mention Franklin County, they're already preserving. And this would actually also possibly become, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but it could become a gateway to preserving an enormous tract of land on Pine Hill that, um, fingers crossed, has not been developed. Um, and um, th th this could be a gateway to that. Um, so there are many aspects to this that go beyond just the simple aspect of uh, honoring, the, you know, the, the memory of, of Conway's possibly most famous, famous citizen. Um, thank you. Right in the back. Sue McFarland, um, Academy Hill Road. I agree with Trish Van Casey. Um, regardless of all this back talk about will we have access, will we not have access, unless we vote on the article with an amendment that specifically calls out that we will have access to this and all the other things that she voiced, I don't feel like we should vote on this right now. So I think there's two things either we can do. We can either make an amendment to the article or we can table it. Anybody else had your hand? If this property has not officially been transferred to the Franklin Land Trust, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. We're putting the cart in front of the horse. Is there a tentative date get, for transfer? I, can you just pull your mask so you can speak? Is there a date for the transfer of this property to the Franklin Land Trust? If Anybody not, have an answer for that? If Is not, there a we're date? We're approving a public, uh, a private property. Don Jarleman from Boyden Road. Excuse me. I uh, served on the board of the Franklin Land Trust for some time, and it was not common, but not also unusual, for a property that had been promised to the trust in the end not to have been donated. And it's for lots of different complicated reasons. Sometimes it's the heirs who lay claim to the value of the land if the persons who wanted to donate it die before the donation is completed. Um, it, it, uh, there's lots of circumstances in which a promised donation actually doesn't happen. I have to agree wholeheartedly with the suggestion that this is premature. Unless and until the land trust has an agreement with the owners of that property that says they now are entitled to control it, it would be foolish on our part to improve the property on the chance that someone might have an interest in selling it down the line. Uh, we, would we would be uh, fresh out of luck. Um, so I'm going to actually suggest, uh, and this is a proposal, that we table this motion until such time as we have clarity on when the transfer will be made to the Franklin Land Trust and have language specifying the conditions under which our money will be put to use. Uh, was that a formal motion to, to table? Okay, did I hear a second? Does everybody understand what we're doing? We're going to vote on a motion to table this. It doesn't kill it, it just postpones it. If they choose to bring it back at a later date. Okay, everybody ready to vote on that? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries.
Okay, unlike what Nick Filler used to do, is he used to set a deadline for 11 o'clock. I propose we make it 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's getting hot. <laughs> Article 21. No, no, G. We get G. Oh, G. We aren't done with those yet. Pardon me, G. G. Provide reserves from fiscal 2021 annual reserves as mandated by state law. 10% for the community preservation and historical uh, reserves, uh, resources reserves, $9,021.05 estimated. 10% to the community preservation open space reserve, $9,021.05 estimated. 10% to the community preservation community housing reserve, $9,021.05 estimated. 5% for administration of the Community Preservation Committee, $4,510.53 estimated, and remainder to the Community Preservation Budgeted Reserve, $58,636.81 estimated. Motion and made and seconded. Any other discussion on it? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 21. I move that the town authorize the treasurer to spend $15,000 from the Medicaid revolving fund to pay related reimbursement fees. Do I hear a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 22. I move that the town authorize the select board to approve a Massachusetts Department of Transportation project to approve a road layout and replace a bridge or bridges on North Poland Road. Motion and second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 23. I move that the town authorize the creation of a revolving fund for what? Can't hear you. Poland Road issue. We, are, we already passed it, and we'll hand. see if we can get you an explanation if you want. Uh, we raised our hand. There are two bridges on North Poland Road close to 116, the two closest to 116. Uh, that are being looked at for being replaced by the state. In order to do that, we're going to have to ascertain and perhaps change the road layout of uh, what we're asking, and that's something that has to be approved by town meeting. So that's what we're asking for here. One of the bridges definitely needs to be replaced, uh, but uh, this is for the project as a whole to allow the select board to move forward and, and make sure that the, uh, the legal aspects of that uh, of the road layout and, and the replacement of the bridges moves ahead. Clarification, these are the bridges by Burnett's property? Yeah. Yes. Don't know. Okay, Article 23. Yes, but yes. can I question? Can you hear the other? I mean, the, article, the article has already passed. I know, but we didn't get to. It passed without a question. It's, it's not a money article anyways, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Correct. Not a money article. Okay. Article 23. I move that the town authorize the creation of a revolving fund for receipts from sales and donations for the purpose of publishing a town newsletter in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53E, one half, with annual expenses not to exceed $5,000 and that the newsletter committee and the town administrator or his or her designee be authorized to expend funds from the account. Got a motion and a second. Discussion? So in this article, it says that there's a newsletter committee, and I know there is, and they're doing a phenomenal job and the town administrator or his or her designee. So who is actually going to be in charge of doling out the money or is this going to be an ever moving volleyball sort of thing where everybody's tossing it around? 
So who's going, Tom? The way it's currently working is the treasurer of the newsletter committee is submitting most of their invoices. There are some jobs um, that I submit invoices for as well. So that's why we said either could do it. Okay, any other questions on that? Get one over here. I think with the David Barton from Baptist Hill Road, I think that we should, in taking this vote, recognize that Marcus McLaurin, who sits right over here, had been the editor of that newsletter from the church for I don't know how many years. And the problem of getting funds for the, his work was literally like pulling teeth out of a chicken. But he did a wonderful job during those years and indeed, towards the end, involved his students at the Franklin Tech School to design it. So I think he deserves a vote of appreciation. Marcus, could you stand up? I don't think anybody knows you. Hey, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Here we go. Article 24. I move that the town rescind the town meeting vote for Article 27 at the April 10, 2006 annual town meeting to establish a housing committee. We had a motion. Any second? And a second. Any discussion? Explanation? I was hoping this would generate some interest in the housing committee. We haven't had one for quite some time. And normally, when an, a, a committee gets appointed and dissolves itself, fails to meet, fails to, technically fails to submit a report for the town report, uh, after a year, that committee is simply dissolved. Uh, however, the, the housing committee was created by an active town meeting town meeting said, this town needs a housing committee. Well, we haven't had one for several years, and we haven't had anyone step up to be on it, to be interested in it. Um, so this is uh, a last ditch attempt to say, you know, if we can get like three to five people to be on a housing committee, let's do that. Um, but if not, then I think it's up to town meeting to take the action to dissolve it um, because town meeting created it. So that's why it's on the warrant. Okay, any other questions? All those in favor? Oh, oh. didn't see you, Joe. <laughs> Tom, I have a question. In our master planning process, we have to have a housing element as well as open space. And I wonder if we dissolve the committee, are we preventing us from taking any state funds if we don't have a committee or a housing plan? No, I don't know the answer. I, I will note that the, uh, the well-discussed Community Preservation Committee, uh, had one of its purposes is for affordable housing as well. So the town does have a, an official housing uh, function and funding mechanism uh, if it would like to use it in that sense. Uh, the committee was was formed by town meeting for uh, specific purposes, specifically uh, senior housing, uh, which is which is narrower than the community preservation committee's uh, role. Uh, but I would think that the community preservation committee uh, affordable housing function would stand for that uh, requirement from the state. Okay, we ready to vote. We got one more over here. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Is there a problem with leaving the town meeting vote to have this committee to keep that on the books for the fact of potential future interest in the housing committee? I do think it's a particularly important issue and, and concerned that 
maybe we would have to go through too many hoops if we wanted to start it again. I realize that, that right now the interest is low. Is there a problem with leaving it on the books? A, a fossil committee. Um, if town, town meeting wanted there to be a housing committee, there is not a housing committee. Um, that's, and that's a problem. I would prefer that there be a housing committee and that it be working on, on senior housing as, 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 it was, as it was created. However, um, it, it, at least this will serve to let everybody know that, that it isn't happening uh, and that we, we have a, a mailbox dedicated to its space in town hall um, that, is, that is not being used. And really, uh, I think either the town should, should have one or not. Susan Fenton, Roaringbrook Road. I think this is a, another good motion to table because perhaps this discussion would um, generate some interest and then if there is no subsequent interest, we can then take up the motion to dissolve the committee. So I'm, do I make a motion, Kenny? Is that what I do? You have right, to make whatever. that motion. Motion to table, the, table this uh, article. Okay, we have a motion and a second to table this, possibly to the future. We got to act it on motion. Okay. It's, a, it's already been seconded. All those in favor of tabling this motion, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. Motion Let me tabled. know. That motion is tabled. Article 25. I move that the town amend its general bylaws by adding a section depositing snow on roads as printed in the warrant. We have a motion and a second. What's our decision here? Changing a bylaw. Two thirds. General bylaws, a majority. You're thinking of my pay grade. I can't answer that. Lori, do you know for sure on that one? Majority. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second on Article 25. Mr. Baker. Before you, before you vote on this article, you may want to take into consideration one thing. A lot of the people, and I'm one of them in this town of Conway, that I live on a hill, and I have my plow truck at my house. For me to get my driveway plowed, I have to go down to the end of the driveway where the town road is, out onto the town road, and turn around and plow it back off. At the same time, I cleared the road all up myself because I know I put the snow out there. If you pass this bylaw, a police officer could be there, and every time I step out on a town road and leave a drizzle of snow, I could get a fine. And I think that is totally bad. If I may speak to that, sir. <laughs> I can assure you, 100%, there will not be a police officer at the end of your driveway <laughs> watching you push snow. <laughs> Furthermore, I cut my budget and they're asking me to do more. <laughs> I believe, and I, I don't know, but I will take a stab at the intent of this article, is to not police everybody pushing their snow out of their driveway, but those probably more geared towards private contractors who do hit and runs on driveways mm -hmm. and leave the snow in the roadway. That's my guess. Would I be somewhat right on that? Ronnie, you want to speak to that? You aren't one of those parties, are you? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the reason for this is because more and more people are plowing their snow into the roadway. 
they're blocking our drainage, they're leaving huge piles of snow in the road. We actually have several places where they plow to the middle of the road expecting the town to clean up the pile from these long driveways. It's a huge issue when the snow plow drivers coming along plowing the road come into these huge piles of snow. We actually have a place where somebody's actually snow blowing their snow into the road. Talk about something hard hitting when you hit that. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're putting our guys at danger with this, plus the traveling public when they come to these places where these snow banks are. Um, we need some kind of way of controlling this. We're not looking to stop people from plowing, normal plowing. I mean, if they plow across the road and they clean it up, we don't have an issue with that. The it's the people, what we don't have any way of stopping the people that aren't cleaning up after themselves. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, does everybody understand the motion? We're ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Second time's a charm. We tried this once before. Oh. Okay. Is this the final article? Final article. Okay. Article 26. I move that the town amend its marijuana bylaw as printed in the warrant. We have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Discussion. Either one. Either one. Whoever. One of you. Thank you. We'd like to amend the motion. Hey, Joe, can you just pull your mask while you're speaking? Thank you. We'd like to amend the motion. Okay. You, want, you want him to do it? Yeah. You do it. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, no, so we're going to recognize prepared. Gary instead. Okay. Gary Fenton, can you hear me? Roaring Brook Road. We would, we collectively, the citizens group that filed the petition, and I'm happy to say the planning board, by a vote of five to zero, would like to amend the description of the amendment to the bylaw to that which was handed out when people walked in today. And I have an explanation as to why we're doing that, if, if I may. So let me just make sure that I'm clear with you. So you're talking about this statement in support of citizens' petition 11.4D? No. I'm talking about the second document in the package that was handed out today, which is a, comp a compare, a red line, or however you want to use okay. the term that describes the changes that we as a citizens group and the planning board are proposing to the marijuana bylaw. Okay, this is this article 11 with all the red. That's writing. correct. Everybody have that? It says article 11 and it's got a lot of red writing on it as well. Early bird special. <laughs> I had to go to Florida a while back. I found out what I should. Okay, everybody got that? Okay, Gary, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. When we've been, let me start from the beginning. Back in January, a group of citizens who were concerned with the marijuana development on Roaring Brook Road spent a lot of time reading the bylaws and attending planning board meetings where we noticed that the planning board went item by item by item through our bylaw. We 
proposed, we thought that there should be some more protections for the townspeople, for residents. And so we put together a petition. We had 50 signatures, and we, that's what was filed with the warrant. The planning board, by, by statute actually, but they were willing, conducted a public hearing on, our warrant, on the warrant amendment. And that we testified, there were testimony in favor. There were testimony with questioning certain parts of the original warrant item. That planning board public hearing was followed by numerous planning board additional meetings, some ultimately by Zoom, which believe it or not worked. And the result was, we're happy to say, and I hope the planning board is happy to say, was a collaboration resulting in what was, hopefully you all have just picked up, which, which is an amendment to the bylaw that, number one, makes it clear that outdoor cultivation is actually to be measured as part of the setback requirements. It was not clear in the original bylaw. I'm sure we know it wasn't intended that way, but we're in Conway and outdoor cultivation is more likely than a big indoor building. And most of the setbacks in 11.4 did not cover outdoor cultivation. So that's really what we started looking at. And some of the other changes are requiring a little more documentation from people who are filing applications so that the planning board is more able to go through the bylaw requirements and protect us, in particular regarding noise, odor, and water. So the result here, with three exceptions, is a bylaw amendment that the planning board voting five to zero and our, the citizens group that spent months at this point working with them have agreed should be an amendment to our bylaw to protect our town. So this document here would be, was a 5-0 agreement by the planning board. With except, except for, for three. three changes. Okay. And they're going to describe what those three changes are. And with your permission, or the group's permission, we will explain why those, we oppose their deleting those three changes, if that's okay. I think, I think we're all looking for explanations. <laughs> Thank you all for staying. I really appreciate it. Okay, just to be clear, the motion is to hand out the entitled citizen's position, petition. The motion uh, is the handout. Ra rather than the motion that John made. It, there's significant changes from what's in the warrant. That's our starting point. Does everybody understand? Everybody okay with that? Everybody on, on board? The, we're starting with this handout, Article 11, with all the red writing in it. Right. No, no. It's Article 26, but the handout, it's Article 11. I, I, an article Although on the warrant. An, an article on the warrant and a motion can be different. So the motion is to start with this document. We have worked extensively with the Citizens Committee, and we've come to an agreement on probably 30 or 40 changes. We have three issues that we'd like to discuss, but we'd like to start with their document rather than what's in the warrant. Okay, everybody understand now? Okay. I'll try to explain this the way it was explained to me. We're starting with this document, they... Some have read. Oh, some. I printed mine off the, okay. So if you printed it at home, it might have okay. read. It has strikeouts. If you printed it at home, it had read in it. <laughs> okay, it says Article 11, Adult Use Recreational Marijuana Establishments and Medical Use of Marijuana. Okay, That's the everybody got that one? That's our starting point. All right, sorry about the red, that was mine. Okay, the, now that you've understood that, <laughs> the planning board would like to make three amendments to the motion. Three Meaning amendments to, to this, this amendment. To this document. And Beth is gonna present the amendments. All right. 
Shall we deal with these amendments one at a time? It would simplify it. You want to come up? Come on up here, Beth. Joe, come on up. You're used to being up here. Want to deal with one at a time? Yeah, we can deal with them one at a time. The First Amendment, which is... Now, the amendments are the second to the last page in the handout, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, you can follow along. This is my swan song, by the way. Apparently, unbeknownst to me. Second to the last page, it says, Planning Board voted 5-0 to not recommend the following three proposed bylaw amendments. The first one is that we'd like to keep Section 114D at 200 feet rather than changing it to 500 feet. But he got that page? We need a second for that amendment again? Well, I guess we'll need a second for that amendment. So, okay. Now okay, so we have a, you want to run the discussion? Yeah. So we have a proposed amendment to the initial amendment, the planning board recommendation is to maintain the 200 foot existing. Any other discussion on this? Right, hi. So I'm, I'm, I'm Susan Fenton, Roaring Brook Road, and um, I was part of the citizens group that took a look at these bylaws and made um, the suggestions to the planning board. And first of all, we'd like to say we're very grateful to the planning board for their cooperation. They were wonderful to work with and a uh, terrific bunch of people. So the reason that we wanted 11.4D to have a 500 foot buffer zone, this is not for any, prop, any uh, residence that is located on the property. This is for a neighboring residence. And the reason we wanted it to be a 500 foot buffer zone is because um, the other two parts of that same section, 11.4 B and C, have a 500 foot buffer zone. And those are designed to keep distance from places where children congregate and parks. And we thought that people's residences where their children were being raised deserved the same level of protection. And so that's why we wanted to move it up to 500 feet. Hi, Mary Parker, Waitley Road. Um, I'm a member of the Agricultural Commission, and earlier this year, we studied everything that was put forth by uh, the Fentons and their group. And we, as a group of the Agricultural Commission, uh, made a recommendation to the select board saying that we were not going to take a stand for or against this. But we did caution and advise that we are very concerned about these setbacks, noise, um, pesticides, fertilizers. And we asked the select board if they knew if the growing of marijuana is considered agriculture. And the state has yet to make that decision. The Agricultural Commission for the town is very concerned that if all these setbacks, controls on fertilizers, uh, disposal of certain things get passed as is, and down the line, the state said, okay, marijuana is agriculture. It is gonna have a tremendous impact on existing agriculture in Conway and future agriculture in Conway. So I just want to throw that out there, that it's very hard. Um, being a farmer is a very tough job these days. There are a lot of restrictions from conservation. There's a lot of restrictions from the state. And if we start putting more and more restrictions, should marijuana growing be considered agriculture, what few farms we have what small farms, the homesteaders, which is becoming very popular, it's not gonna happen up here. So we have to be very careful and either change something that says that regardless of what the state says, whether it is or is not agriculture, the town has to take a stance or the people of this town and say whatever laws pertain to the mar growing of marijuana does not pertain to the growth, growing or agriculture in Conway, 
that we do have bylaws that states what is agriculture. So just I, I can answer mind. that particular question. The, the current state bylaws exempt agriculture or farming from uh, zoning regulations. Farming, they, they exempt farming from regulation by the zoning board, if you will. In order to allow the towns to regulate marijuana growing, they removed marijuana from the description of agriculture. So for the purposes of zoning only, we can, it is not considered agriculture, marijuana is not considered agriculture, and we can regulate it. There's nothing in the law that allows us to regulate all other farming, if you will, other than marijuana. Hemp, for instance, can be grown. Uh, anybody can grow hemp if they want to. There's no regulations on the books for hemp. It, so it's they, con they had to allow, they, they probably figured the law wouldn't pass if towns weren't allowed to regulate it. So in order to do that, they had to remove agriculture from a zoning exemption. And they did that by saying it's not farming. Beth, did you have something you want? The point is, rest assured, we're not trying to regulate any other farming in Conway other than marijuana. I'm Beth Gershman. I'm the chair of the planning board. I live on Hoosick Road. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, I just want to draw your attention to our reasoning of why we are not recommending these, these, uh, this one as well as two other proposed amendments. It's on, this, it's on the next to last page of the handout. I, um, I'm just going to reiterate it, which is that we really, uh, all, all five of us who thought about this for a long time, discussed this for a long time, looked at a lot of other town bylaws in our area, as well as throughout the state, we believe that more than doubling this distance between any Conway residents and proposed business or grow operation limits the number of properties that could fit the new requirements. So most residences are already set back from their property lines. And additionally, in terms of farming, um, uh, we've noticed, of course, and I'm sure everyone has, that uh, a lot of farming, if, if you increase this distance, you would have to go into um, forested areas. Just, just that. Um, taken all together, I'm just going to speak to these three right now while I have the mic. Uh, taken all together, uh, the five of us felt that these amendments had the effect of discouraging marijuana growing in Conway. And what we took away from both the town meeting where we passed the bylaw, as well as our public hearings, was that people in Conway were supporting organic growing and outdoor growing. We're looking, we were looking really at attempting to support farmers and also not to only encourage greenhouse growing. Greenhouse growing would mean year-round growing with, uh, with uh, additional energy, water, and um, noise, and odor, and everything, things going on. So that's, that's that. Just to add to Beth's comment, if you think about, uh, let's say the Boyden farm across the street, if you put in the 500 feet, and there's a house across the street from them, they have to go 500 feet into the woods or to the back of the land, which I think is probably up on the hill. That seems excessive to the planning board that you would have to go that far. I understand the need to protect the abutters, but we really feel that 200 feet was a good number and we think 500 would discourage people from starting uh, marijuana farming. Okay, Gary. Oh, hello, hi. Just to your point, I'll just read the first couple of words in the setback. It says, marijuana establishments shall not. It's not dealing with farming. It is, and the marijuana establishment is only the growing and cultivation of marijuana. It, so regardless of whether the state changes, whether it's called agriculture or not, this bylaw that you're voting, that we've already voted for that matter, is only applying to marijuana establishments, not, nothing else. Um, as far as 500 feet, it's a question of thinking about you, every single one of you, live, as a homeowner, 
living in a house where, the, I hate, I'm sorry to say, the particular project on our street was approved for 100,000 square feet outdoor grow. That's not a small time farmer. That is somebody who's incredibly well funded, spending a lot of money to build a 100,000 square foot facility or outdoor grow. Do you want that 200 feet from your house? We thought 500 feet made more sense. We thought it protected all of you and that's why we were proposing it. It doesn't help us, but that's it. Hey. Um, oh, right there. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, the wall's that way. So, um, first of all, John. Can you state your name? Oh, sorry, Leah Bowden, uh, Main Poland Road. Um, the applicant for the marijuana business in question, John Moore, he's here somewhere, I assume, uh, is a farmer. He's been farming in Conway for many years, and if you want to do something that will help many farmers, um, you want to keep the restrictions as low as possible because the state is already restricting marijuana establishments um, very severely, and w probably the reason why John is trying to start such a large business is because the capital required to meet the state requirements is so high that in order for him to make money and also generate money for the town, he has to scale to that. Okay, any other discussion on this? I'm going to speak in favor of increasing to 500 feet. I think that um, it's important that we respect the beauty and rural quality of our town by the same token allowing marijuana growing. And I think that the 500 foot uh, change would, would be uh, very sufficient and do well to protect our children and to continue to protect the rural quality of many of our beautiful roads and farms here. Thank you. Okay, way down the, way down to that end first. I saw. My name is John Moore. I am the applicant on Waitley Glen Road, the only applicant in town. For everyone's edification, 100,000 square feet is two and a half acres. It's not an awful lot when you're talking about farming. The reason we have to do that big is because it's outdoors. It takes one-tenth of the energy that by our bylaws, the people that are exempt in this town from all of our bylaws are the multi-billion dollar companies that you're trying to stop from coming in here. We've talked already to lawyers about our bylaws and if you look under the definitions that you've got there, it says marijuana establishments or cultivators, retailers, everybody, except medical treatment centers. They own 80% of the market right now. Those are the giant multinationals. So you have now exempt them from your town. And you're trying now to stop the small farmers from participating in this business. I think it's time to stop this nonsense. It hasn't hurt anybody in, in 9,000 years. It's not going to. Okay, we had somebody over here. Andy Jaffe, Academy Hill. I just wanted to know, Joe, um, or Beth, or, uh, is this true that there's only one uh, uh, viable application at this point? So we're actually talking about this singular application, or are there other ones as well? This one has already been dealt with, so this is future. Anything that comes after it's approved by the Attorney General would come under the new regulation. And just to address John's comment, if you read the title, we did add marijuana treatment centers, and we added it as a definition. So the bylaw, the term medical uh, establishment also includes, I mean, marijuana <laughs> establishment also includes medical treatment center. So it, we addressed the issue that you brought up at the meeting in this revision. Uh, Chief Murphy, Lucart Road. 
I spent my entire life as an agricultural consultant, and let me assure you, two and a half acres is an absolutely tiny firm. It's a lot of pot, I'll grant you that. But it's not enough, it's not enough land to qualify for an APR. It's, I don't think it's enough to even qualify for 61A. This is minuscule. In, in my business, I wouldn't even consider it a farm. I'd consider it somebody with a real big garden. <laughs> okay, are we ready? To, oh, way in the back. I, uh, just a fact question. How far is it from this wall to that wall? 150 feet, I believe. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to vote on the amendment? Oh, okay. Jeez, Last one. Me on these people. Um, so where were all of you when the solar panel situation came through? Like that didn't make certain residents, residential areas ugly? Seriously. Thank you. Hey. Everybody's got a right to their opinion. Okay, let's, uh, let's, last one. All right, then we're going to vote on the amendment to the amendment. So um, I just wanted you all to look at this from a point of view of the revenue to the town. So we're in a pandemic, we're in a fiscal crisis, we're, we're, we're a town with no infrastructure, no ability to attract businesses. One of the only opportunities for us to grow income in terms of business prospects is through cannabis, is through marijuana farming. And the, the idea, you know, we've already been harmed. We need to recognize that we have already been harmed. We've harmed ourselves with over-regulating this. And I, I am referring now to our marijuana moratorium, which was an ill-advised idea. And I don't, at the time it made sense. And I'm not criticizing anybody that was for it. What I'm saying is that that did not work out to our advantage. The reason being is because we had retail opera operators that looked at our town, found out there was a moratorium, went to the town next to us, all the towns surrounding us, all of them, have retail or, 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 or uh, grow, grow operations. The, the people that have retail, the towns that have retail, are all budgeting six figures in income from that for this year, for each one. So the, the idea, you know, we, we are giving up uh, the, you know, the, the idea that we would just shoot ourselves in the foot again and make these things harder for people to get, make these licenses harder to get, reduce our possibility of getting new revenue. This, this one that's going in, uh, the, the estimates are between fifty dollars and $100,000 annual income to the town. Uh, hello. Um, you know, and, and, and it might be less than that. It might be more than that. Depends on how well they do. We want them to do well as a town. Okay, are we ready to vote on this amendment to the amendments? All right, those in favor, this is going to be just majority for the amendment. Okay, those in favor of keeping it existing 200 feet, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, so the ayes have it, so the existing stays. Okay, let's take the second. Oh, that would be the cultivation. Yeah, okay, the second amendment is section 11.5K, cultivation, the next one down. Um, the citizen's proposal is to add a sentence, an additional application for a special permit that includes outdoor cultivation shall not exceed tier five level and shall be not, and shall not be granted for more than three years. Um, so again, I just direct your attention to the handout, and once again, we voted five to nothing, and we recommend deleting this second sentence in its entirety, and the reasoning behind that was twofold. One was we really believe that setting initial limits um, imposes a, a financial burden upon new farms and new businesses. And the three-year restriction runs counter to the state and uh, community host agreement five-year licensing. Hi, so Susan Fenton, I'm still Susan Fenton. <laughs> 
Um, so we thought that um, to give the town the opportunity to... Sue, I don't think everybody can hear you there. I'm sorry. So we thought that to give the town the opportunity to determine whether or not this was or was not a good idea, it would be better to start small, which is originally the way the Roaring Glen Farm was supposed to start relatively small, and then it mushroomed in size before anybody had a chance to take a look at it. So, um, at, so we thought having it be a relatively smaller, not not uh, uh, not the same size uh, tier five. I forget how many how many square feet of, of canopy that is, but um, we thought starting there for a period of three years made sense because then we could see whether there were problems, and if there weren't any problems, then we could very easily allow that to be expanded. So that's why we thought that was a good suggestion. I'd like to comment to that. Um, number one, the, the applicants for a marijuana establishment have to, prior to meeting with us, put in a five-year host agreement with the town. So it's going to be very awkward, I think, if you have a five-year agreement with the select board and you have a permit that could expire in three years. It also limits the size of your operation. You voted down the 500, thank you for that. But if you take all the changes together, I think it sends a message that we don't want marijuana in town. I, I think if you had passed all three of these, the message is no marijuana in Conway. But so my argument here is it doesn't make sense to limit it to three years if they have an agreement with the selectman for five years. When we talked to town council about our bylaw, he said, you only allowed five years? Typically, they're longer than that. And now there's a proposal to make it even less. Uh, I think your license, John, maybe you can address that. I think that's a yearly thing. Yeah. But, but the agreement with the town is a five-year. And now in three years, in theory, your special permit would run out and you'd have to apply again for a new permit. So that's our reason for not supporting it. Okay. Any discussion from the rest of us on that? Ready to vote on that? Okay, so the amendment is to delete the last sentence in section K. Right? Delete sentence two. Sentence two, yeah. Okay, all those in favor of deleting sentence two signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Last for the meeting is that we're recommending you not adopt this character of the neighborhood clause. Um, first, it's, uh, sorry, 11.5T, it's on the bottom of that page. Um, the consideration for character of the neighborhood already exists in our bylaw in section uh, 64, the special permit process requires us to take into account effects on the neighborhood. I think the problem here is that we were not able to find significant evidence that there would be an effect. The, the proponents are claiming loss in land value and, and other things that they're going to expound on, but it's very hard to prove that. And the applicant then can challenge us in court if he wants to, to see our evidence that these things would happen. So it's a, it's a difficult process. The second part of this that I'm struggling with even more is they've, they've made it a distance. Um, now that you've left into 200, we're going to have to consider everybody between 200 and 1,000 and a feet. What? But the problem is it's five houses in that area. What if it's only two? And what if you're one of those people? Do you want us to say that we're not going to impose the neighborhood clause on you because there's only one of you or two of you. I think it's very arbitrary to pick five people within a certain distance and say that below that, you don't have to consider those people. I'm arguing against myself here, I think, but if you understand the problem that somebody a thousand feet away gets much more weight than, than one or two people closer. There has to be this limit of five or six people before this clause goes into effect. Beth, did you want to say something? Yeah. 
Uh, the planning board members again voted five to nothing against this, adding this uh, piece. And we really felt that it was um, difficult to interpret and it would add a real burden to the special permit process. Um, we felt it was uh, an arbitrary thing and that, again, as Joe said, that our existing special permit process already addresses the question of character. It's one of the things that we take into consideration when we look at things for special permitting and it's one of the negotiation pieces already. Okay, so um, uh, with with all due respect to the planning board, and, and you're, I've already talk, told you how much I appreciate them. Um, when we were sitting in the public hearing addressing the um, Roaring Glen Farm issue, the planning board very rightfully went right down the list of things that it had to consider. And it considered, um, there's a whole long list of, of factors in, in the bylaws. You can, you can see them, they're still there. And um, there was no place where, with specific regard to marijuana farming, um, there was no place that required the um, planning board to specifically consider whether or not this was a neighborhood of families and whether or not there would be an adverse property value um, on, on our properties. I mean, some of us live, you know, less than a thousand feet from where Roaring Glen Farm is going to be. And, you know, we've, we've seen articles that say that people who live in close proximity to those things do lose property value. So, again, as Gary said before, if this is your neighborhood, how do you feel about it? And if you think that the planning board should specifically have to consider the character of the neighborhood with regard to an application for a marijuana special permit, then they would be in support of this particular amendment. Thank you. David. This is an issue uh, that is very familiar to me because I was on the planning board years ago and was an associate. The thing that concerns me is that if you look at the town of Conway, it's made up of more than just one neighborhood. It's made up of large properties, it's made of small properties, and the historic nature of the town is that there were about 10 different communities with community centers. So Baptist Hill, being the oldest in one respect of these communities, has properties of one acre, half acre, four acres. There's a four acre farm still there owned by the Edward Zajac and so on. And if you look around, maybe there are one or two acres that are still available for maybe some kind of cultivation because there was a development on Emerson Hollow Road of two acres. I would suggest that the planning board go neighborhood by neighborhood and actually identify the character of a neighborhood because are there are some places where there are no neighborhoods. There are way people, you know, 10, 10 acres, 15 acres. It's not true where we live. And this kind of bylaw, if somebody decided in our area, like Edward, to farm on four acres with just half acre plots around him, it would make a major impact. Joe, you're getting off just in time. Okay, any other discussion? What we got? Way down. Go ahead. So um, we lived downtown on Main Street for about 15 years, and Rusty Blossom painted his house, and it glowed onto our house. And it was okay. We survived. It's okay. It's okay. I, I, I think this is kind of a moot point because if, if you have a solar panel out there on the ugly little stand, hello. Enough said. John? Okay, the question has been called. So we're ready, to, we're ready to vote on this, on the amendment, the final amendment. I can't hear a word you're saying. 
We are voting on the amendment section 11.5T, as in Tom, character of neighborhood. Okay. Those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Those opposed to the amendment. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> I know it's late. If you're in favor of the amendment, which is the planning board's amendment to delete it. Right? Okay, everybody clear? No. We're voting with the planning board. <laughs> okay. One more time. Those in favor of voting with the planning board on their amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed. The ayes have it. Okay, now we're not done. Now that we've gone through the amendments to the amendment, now we have to vote on the amendment as amended. Yeah, this is a two-thirds, so my counters are still here, right? All right. <laughs> All right. So we're basically, we're voting on this Article 11 handout with the amended changes we already made. Those in favor of the amended article signify by saying aye. Those opposed? All right, we'll open it up for discussion again. We already discussed it. We discussed every amendment, but we'll open it up. All right, I can't hear a word you're saying. You got a mask on and no microphone. Wait till you get a microphone. All I hear is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> all right, let's okay, go. Okay, with all due respect, yes. we've been commenting on very specific items of the amendment. There's been no comment on this whole big thing, which is, I believe, what we're voting on now. Okay, go okay. ahead. Let's, let's, let's open it up. Okay, my comment again, George Murphy, Lucart Road, uh, having been an agricultural consultant forever, I look at this list and it says we have to list all, all fertilizers and submit it to, well, it doesn't say who you have to submit it to, but it's got to be submitted. Hey, Murph, can you just specify what's Oh, I'm sorry, section? 7B. 7B, it says they, they've got to submit a report on what they have in stock for fertilizer. Now, I know the difference between corn and marijuana. I know the difference between weed and weeds. But the difference between organic 548 in these people's barn and 548 in some other farmer's barn, why is only one being regulated? This makes no sense. This has no effect on public safety. These are the exact same chemicals. What does it matter if the pallet of 10 is in Ron Boyden's barn or this guy's barn? It's all the same stuff. Why is it only a safety issue on a marijuana farm? This makes no, no sense. This is nothing but harassment. That's all this is, is harassment. Okay, hang on. I'll try to address that. The state has in the marijuana regulations a list of either approved or unapproved pesticides, I can't remember which, and they're proposing to add a, another group, I believe they're all unapproved, so there has to be a mechanism to make sure that the unapproved pesticides are not being used. Point, sir. Fertilizer is not a pesticide, and it is not regulated by the state? Yes, we can take out fertilizer if, if that's the issue. We can't take out pesticides, I don't think. I'm not saying you should. I, I talked about fertilizer. This is just harassment. Can you, can you, I, I lost the section you're referring to. 70. I'm Mary, I'm Mary McClintock. I'm on the Conway Planning Board. The section G. Are we looking at on the on the 
On the uh, Article 11, Section 11.5G, 11 okay. right now it's, it says it's hazardous materials, submission of a complete list. The existing bylaw is all the text in regular font. The only thing that this article is trying to do is add all inorganic and organic chemicals to that list. Town meeting voted unanimously for this bylaw with that wording in September 24, 2018. So, so okay, so understanding that fertilizer is a non-regulated, not, not a pesticide. I, okay. I have no argument about whether fertilizers are regulated or not. In Conway's bylaw right now, as of today, it, this, all the text in here that is in regular font is right now the law in Conway. For this only for this farm? For, only any, for any marijuana farm. establishments. Okay. This is a marijuana, this is, this is, what you're seeing in this 11 with all the regular print is the bylaw as it exists. The only thing that we're voting on today is whether to strike out the things that are struck out and add the things that are underlined um, and, and, um, and italicized. So this is already right now law. It has nothing to do with agriculture. It only has to do with marijuana. George, if, if everybody agrees with you, we can change it. I think the context of this was that the town wanted to know about all the hazardous materials that would be involved in this site. Okay. I mean, some some marijuana some marijuana processors use uh, butane to to extract their chemicals, right? I know, I know. I'm just saying for for extraction. Uh, we didn't put anything in our bylaw. You can't use butane. We probably, but it would be on this list. It would be a hazardous chemical. People have blown up their their extraction facilities with butane. If you don't want fertilizer in there, I'm okay with it, but. I it was trying to make an inclusive list of chemicals. I think you're kind of missing the point. It's okay. The point, the point is, is that organic fertilizer is not a regulated product. You can put seven tons of it on a truck. You don't have to put up placards. It's not a pesticide. It's not a pesticide. It's not a pesticide. Okay? People need to get that through their heads. A bag of chicken poop should not be regulated. You shouldn't, have to, you shouldn't have to fill out a report to submit because you bought a bag of chicken poop. That's just silliness, just plain silliness. So in the last vote that we attempted to take that I think we didn't take, um, it feels to me that we weren't taking the right vote. Now, we've, we've taken a vote on three of the changes that, that the planning board is proposing to, to the neighbor's amendment, to the neighbor's amendment to the, to the bylaw. So right now it feels like we're facing two things. The vote is, do we accept the, the planning board's rewrite of their old bylaw without those changes that they just asked us to remove, or to leave the bylaw alone like they originally wrote it? And I'm not sure how that was included that, in that vote. That, that's not a correct statement. There are numerous other changes in the bylaw that we worked, uh, I can't think of the right word, <laughs> cooperatively with the petitioners to include. And we decided after we had over the initial frustration of having to go through this process, we might as well use it to make all the other improvements to the bylaw that we were thinking about, like adding medical marijuana and adding, so a lot of these were negotiated or we put them in on our own saying these are changes to clarify the language. So there are other amendments other than the three that we agreed to disagree on. We, we only talked about the three we disagreed So you're speaking in favor of this amended text. Yes. Um, that, but it feels to me that's the vote we should be taking, whether or not to adopt your amended text. Right, that's what we tried to do, but we got interrupted. Okay.
Any other questions other than I move that we table this. Well, that would be a mistake. <laughs> Nobody seconded it. So we got a vote on. We got a motion and a second. We're going to vote. We're going to vote whether to table this one. All those in favor of tabling this, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Nay. No, that wasn't a two-thirds. So we're going to continue the discussion. Um, so I have a question about G again, where it says underlined all organic or organic. I don't know how that changes that paragraph because it just says list all the chemicals. So I don't know what that brings to the whole situation. And then on E up above it says no objection, objectionable noise or odors. Well. Some people can't stand the smell of onions, and other people really like it. So isn't that really not something we want to get into? Because then it depends on who is in charge at the time or who's growing the um, marijuana it, as to who's going to object to it. So I would like to maybe consider getting rid of that. And as far as the going back to G, sorry, fertilizers go, while I'm in complete agreement with that. I don't think we should start changing these kind of things right here on the town floor. I think that needs to be taken a look at. Thank you. It, would it be possible to get clarification on which of the changes are planning board driven and which of the remaining changes are um, petition driven or is that sort of like? I, it, it sounds to me from what they've said here they are agreed unanimously on the changes, other than those three that we already dealt with. But, but, but as Joe d explained, not all of the changes that the planning board that has, not everything that's underlined and italicized was asked, by, was something that the neighbors asked for. Some of it, they just cooked up on their own and said, oh, we're gonna fix this and that. Mary, you wanna address that? We thought you'd have such a good time with one revision to the marijuana bylaw, we decided not to give you two. So the planning board, parallel to the process of the, um, of the uh, petitioners, we had already been discussing that, gee, our experience of going through using the bylaw to work on a permit process showed us some gaps in the bylaw that the town voted unanimously for on September 24th, 2018. So we, one of the gaps is the one that um, has already been mentioned, which is right now, if somebody came to town right now before anything votes on this and wanted to put up a big medical treatment, marijuana medical system, we have no town bylaw related to medical marijuana. We only have a town bylaw related to adult use recreational marijuana. So that was one of the things we decided to add, was that we wanted to add, was let's add medical. Another thing that happened was when the bylaw was originally created, we were looking at the idea of buildings like this, not the idea of outdoor cultivation. We got a lot of pushback from the town saying we want outdoor cultivation, but the bylaw didn't get as tweaked in relation to outdoor cultivation. So we wanted to clarify what we meant by, you know, what setbacks related to outdoor cultivation, et cetera. Those are two examples of the kinds of things the planning board was already looking at. Unreal, if this, if we would be here right now talking about those if the petition had never happened. So when the petitioners came and said, hey, we want to do these other things, we all got together and said, okay, we have some stuff that we want, you have some stuff you want, let's talk about it. We talked about it, we, had, we talked about it, we talked about it some more, and we came up with this thing that you have in your hand as one article for town meeting instead of bringing the petitioner's article and the planning board's article, which would be immensely confusing. 
So that's what this is, and that's, that's what we're doing. And the three, th and you've already heard, the three things we didn't agree on. But everything else, this was a joint process. But those were two of the major things, medical and the clarifying what we meant by out around outdoor cultivation. Were there any other major ones? Hi. Uh, Phyllis Jeswold, Old Cricket Hill Road. So I was at a planning board or two, and it's clear to me that the planning board was very thoughtful about this. They were not biased. They were very open to the original petition. I heard the arguments on both sides. And I think that we need to trust that a lot of smart people, what, six members of the planning board, five, <laughs> have now looked at this and looked at this and looked at this. And uh, we need to trust that they are extremely knowledgeable and have the best interest of the town in mind. And I would like to call the question. OK. That, that does end discussion. <clears throat> OK. So is everybody clear on what we are voting for this time? We are going to be voting for the amended bylaw okay as it was written minus the three the we that we amended earlier okay all those in favor of the motion as amended signify by saying aye, aye. those opposed we need counters One last thing before we adjourn. We got to count. Oh, we got count. Uh, we got to count. Okay, those in favor. Who's my other counter over here? Do I have somebody here to volunteer to be a counter on this half? Okay. Hold your hands high, please. It's late. I know we want it all out. If you're in favor of the amended changes, signify by saying aye. Hold your cards up. Okay, go ahead, count. Please keep them up so we don't have to do this multiple times. This half, this half has lazy arms. You guys can put them down. Got them? We good? You can put them down. Okay. Those opposed, raise them high so we can see them.
passes by one vote. Did I hear recount? Uh, we count, they, they counted, they agreed. Okay. We are about to make, except one last motion. The chairman has asked me to let him say a couple of words. Just one last thing. I'd like to get a show of hands. How many people would be in favor of a Saturday town meeting? All right, I just wanted to get a, get a feeling for it. Thank you. Okay, I'm waiting for one last motion. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you for being here.